Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So we spoke about the um, we saw the output of each of those layers. So as we build the conversion neural networks, we saw the effect of filters and some other things. So today we are going to um, do two applications of conversion neural network. The first one is um, style transfer, and the second is GANs. So the two of them, they work with the whole convolutional layer network flow. So start transfer specifically, this is those convolutional layers we discussed to do something that's interesting. So like we're going to start with start transfer before going to GANs. So I'm sure we've probably heard of GANs, generative adversarial neural networks. So generative adversarial networks, just generative adversarial networks, while style transfer. So also, I think some people normally mix style transfer with transfer learning. Although they are very, very wide apart, so why you just call the transfer learning between two of them? But I'm sure we know what transfer learning is. So, style transfer itself basically means transferring styles between images. So, that's what I'm going to look at first. Let me share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Yeah. So, so I was going to look at some Google images of some things people have done in style transform. So for instance, this is an example of it here. I'll just open different images. Yeah. And this. So these are two images of style transform. So what it does is that you have two images. So you have the first image, which is this and you have another image, which is this. So what style transfer helps you do is to take the content of one image. So in this case, this first image is the content you want to take, and then take the style of the second image, which is this, and merge them together to form a new target image. So this target image consists of the content of this first one and the style of the second one. So that was what I'm going to discuss on how to do. So this is just a simple example of it. Then also, this, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but it's the same process. So this is our um, Android. Then this is an image and condition of both of them gives this. So in most cases, um, it's just this, this transfers the style. The, the, the network gets the style of this one and merges it to the content of this one. So we can achieve this. So there's a paper actually. So this is the style transfer paper. So I just need to look at some important parts of it. Here that so specifically they use VGG19. So I don't know if you can try it on other networks, but basically you need to know the output of other networks. So there are just some certain theories that style transfer follows in order for you to achieve this same thing. So we'll look at it as we keep moving. So they explain the process here. So before that, let's just start with the whole style transfer thing. So this is it here. So yeah, definitely we'll get these notebooks. So if you have a neural network like this, so you can see this consists of both the conventional neural network and the um, fully connected layer, which is the most layer perception. So from this, our input image, this one's colored purple or lilac. And from this point to this place is our feature extractor side or the convolutional neural network. Then this last one in green, this light green is our fully connected layer. So basically our features get extracted in these earlier stages, which is convolutional layers. So for representation and which they use in this paper, you can see they represented them with conf21, conf31, conf41, and so on. So for VGD16, the way they structure their layers, so I don't know if you remember when we spoke about convolutional layer network, how we can identify each layers. So it's more like a dictionary. So you can just say if you design your model and you need it. We do model dot fc just like what we did in transfer learning to so focus on a particular one. So it's the same thing here. So VDG they divided that into model dot features. Model dot features gives you the convolutional aspect of it. I don't know if it's the same thing as ResNet or that one. But for VDG, they separated it as the classifier side, or that is the model dot features and model dot classifier. So model dot features is the CNN side, model dot classifier is the linear side. So for representing it now, 
remember what we said. So, so in when we did conversation network, someone mentioned why we're using padding. So and I mentioned that padding helps us get helps us retain, retain the size of the image while also increasing the depth. So the depth is the number of features that were um, the feature maps basically. So we keep appending features and this depth keeps increasing. So here we can see that we just applied the depth two times here. So they definitely use padding to retain the size. Then at this point now, which is the orange side, they applied the max pooling. They only have a new convolutional side with um, this X depth. I don't know the size of the depth. Then we applied max padding. So just what max padding is, um, no, that's a max padding, max pooling. So just know that the max pooling is this orange side. So we kept reducing the dimension and keep reducing the dimension and the depth kept increasing. So now for representative purpose now, Conv11 is the first layer of our convolutional side. Conv12 is the second one of our first convolutional side. So if you can see it here, Conv11 is the first one, still under the first convolutional block. So this is the first convolutional block here. This is the second convolutional block. This is the third convolutional block. This is the fourth, and this is the fifth. So to know the particular layers, so Conv11 is the first layer, Conv12 is the second layer of the first one, then Conv21 is the first layer of the second convolutional block, and Conv21 is the second layer of the second convolutional block. So the same thing with these two. It's the same process, the same thing with this. Then this one is Conv54, which is the last one, the last block of it. Do you understand it up to this point? Yes. Okay, yeah, thanks. So, so now, the whole point of style transfer now is that it separates the style and content of separate images. So, and this thing, they actually already explained it well. So I'll just go over it and give us more explanation on what they already mentioned in this notebook. So you have two images down. So let's say we have this content image because I definitely need to get two images. We have the content image and the style image. So from the paper, they mentioned the bill list, they explained the procedure we need in order to achieve this thing. So for the content image now, what you need to do is to extract the content from this image. So, you know, as we keep moving our image through the whole convolutional layer here, as we keep moving our input image inside, different features keep getting extracted. So from paper, they discovered that at the particular convolutional layer, they extracted the best form of images. So for the content side now, you know, we keep reducing the spatial dimension. So deep down, like this fifth one, this fifth convolutional side, the image would have been broken down to the level where we don't have an image again. Instead, we have features. So area part of this have the image it's in it. So for this first convolutional one, I can get that since we still have the image dimension, it does have few things, few things get lost. If you notice where we looked at the convolutional side, after we applied our convolutional neural network, and we saw the output of it, we realized that we still had the image, or even though we applied some filters, so we're just seeing edges, but the main image was still there. So at a particular layer of this conventional um, block, at a particular layer, we can extract the content of the image. So we're going to see it through that paper. So they mentioned it in the paper. So that's how we can get the content part. Then for the style part, so they also mentioned the procedures for getting style. So you know style is totally different from content. So they had a special way of getting it. So I'm going to talk about this. So, so the method they use is grammar matrix. But basically, just to explain how the style one works. So in order to add guess the style of the image, of a particular image, there's, um, you basically just want to find the correlation between all the features in a particular convolutional block. So that's a method of getting it, the style. So how it works is that if you have this convolutional layer, like this first one now, you check all the, um, the correlation between each of those features there. So based on the paper, that's how they said it works. And that's what extracts the, the style for you. So you find a way to get the correlation between features in a particular convolutional block, and then compare it to that of the original image. I hope, okay, let me just keep going. We, we get to understand this later. So the point is that, first of all, we're going to get these two images. So 
let me use here since um I can't run I, I don't have this pill on my local um system. So I'll just use Google Colab. So I'll just use Google um, the this one since they are visual representations of most things. Why we run the code on Colab? Okay, yeah, I think it's best if you look at the by itself why this one is running. So if you, from this paper here, so this is what you mentioned here. So if you check from this side, they mentioned on top of the original CNA presentation, we built a new feature space that captures the style for an input image. So the style representation computes correlation between the different features in the layer of this, in the layers of each CNN. So um, let, let me oops, put this down. So for each layer of the CNN now, it gets the correlation between features there. So now look at it. So, so we construct the style of the input image from style presentation based on different subset of standing layers. So from the first one, which is the convolved one, so they mentioned it for us that the convolved one, so they get the features for this one, compute the correlation. So we have the correlation for this first block here. Then the next one, which is then convolved and compute two one, which is at this point, you know, as you keep passing an image, your image will pass through this layer, pass through the second layer. So basically what you have in this second layer is combination of the first layer and this one too. So up to this point, you get the um, correlation of each of the features here, store it. In this third one, which is conv one, one conv two, one, conv three, one, they mentioned it here. So and conv three, one, conv one, one, conv two, one, and conv three, one. So up until this point, we also compute the correlation again. And we keep computing correlation up until conv 5 one. So this creates images that match the style of the given image on an increasing scale. So with this method now, we can get the style part. So I don't know whether it's this part for people, but there's for the, for the content part, like I've mentioned, in order for you to get the content of an image for VGG19, the conv 40, which we see in the code, is the one that holds the output of it, outputs the content of the image. So at that point, it gets the maximum form of that image itself. So if you, if you can just identify it from here, so if this is the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, so conv 22 is this particular one here. So this is the one that gives us the content of the image. So with all this, we are going to use it to not train this time around, they're not training a real network. We're going to train however this we're going to update the the values of a given image, which is our target image, for it to fit into both the content of the content image and the style of the style image. So yeah, so just go to the code. So first of all, we we get our VGG side. So like I've mentioned, it's just the features part. So that's why we are doing models dot vgg19 pre train the course through and we're extracting the feature part of it. So I just want to add something to make sure that we understand this. What is the difference between pre-trained through and pre-trained false? Does anyone know? Um, what is the message? So you can send the message if you want, or you can save. I think pretend, pretend true comes with the weights and the biases of the pretend model, I guess. So it doesn't really mm -hmm. train. How false mm -hmm. doesn't come with the weights and the biases or something like that. Yes, yes. So pre-trained pre -trained false, let's start with that. Pre-trained false just comes with the model architecture, but doesn't contain the model parameters at all, like it says, the weights and the biases. So it's more like it's just a neural network structure. So you know when we're building our own convolutional neural network, we just build the network structure then we start training from scratch. So pre-trained true gets, is more like downloading. You know, when you train a model and you save your model, it's more like loading that saved model. So most of these models have been trained already. Yeah, so 
through update width and use previous width, pauses opposite. Um, but you know, just confirm like this this particular fold, fold itself, between folds means that we're just loading the network structure. So it does not contain any weight at all. So it's more like we're going to build this thing from scratch. So I think the one that um, he mixed what you are talking about, that's um, pretty sure we missed, is that we're then talking about freezing. So freezing is when you do not want to update the weight while you're training. So you just want to train and probably um, just update only the weight for your fully connected layer side. So that's your choice. So the point is that you don't want those parameters to be changed at all. So when you unfreeze it, you want those parameters to change. That's just the difference. So pre-train falls just lose the architecture. So now let's just say that what I'm saying now. So you know it's text and one is width. So if you say pre-train falls here, you just realize that it's loading just text files. So this is just the structure I'm supposed to. So this is just load the text file. So this is just the network architecture. So it doesn't even contain anything, it's not downloading anything. When you put print range through, you want to download the weight. So you can see it here. So you're downloading the weight, VGG19.pth, the same way we save our model. So that's the difference between two of them. So I've downloaded VGG16. So I have to just notice that if you wanted to um, classify between, and um, if you wanted to class with MG, the classifier that can classify dogs, or most things that come on, you know you can actually just pass a VGG, um, if you can just load a pre-trained model, one of these pre-trained models that are trained on that 1,000 classes, and just pass your image to it, and to give you an output as any of the, one of these 1,000 classes. So you don't actually, so the point is that you already have a full network that has been used and trained on something. So that's just how it works. So now for this case now, we are not going to update these parameters at all since we are not trying to modify the GG16 or make it better. The point is that we just want to make use of some things, some of the layers in this VGG16. So we specifically need to freeze all the parameters because we do not want to modify anything related to it. So after loading the features part, because we are going to be working with all the features, sorry. Um, from here, if you can see, we are going to work with only this part here from here to here. So we don't have anything to do with the fully connected side. So, so um, we, we specify that we're freezing the layer. So this is the freezing aspect, setting parameters, required grass pause. Then we move our, then we move our model to GP here. So now from here, we can then map this to what we're talking about in this place. Which one is from one one, from two one. Just know that different between each of these blocks are the max pooling layers. So after there's a max pooling layer, we have the next block. So we can just map it by ourselves here. Does anyone have anything to say? Okay, okay. Yeah. So from here, we can easily map it that conv, this first conventional block is our conv 1D, is our conv 1, 1 rather. This is our conv 1, 1. Then this is our conv 1, 2, conv 1, 2. Then we have a max pooling. So that's the end of the first one. So this is Conv two one, conv two two, we have the max pooling. Then conv three one, conv three two, conv three three, conv three four. Then we have the max pooling. Yeah. Then conv four one, conv four two, conv four three, conv four four. Then we have conv five one, five two, five three, five four. So you can see that this exactly maps what we spoke about here. So the last one is called five for the VGG19 pre-trained model. So this is what it looks like. So first of all, we're going to load our content and style image. So um, okay, I stopped here. I did this on this. So I just downloaded two images that we can use. So the first one is this guy here, the new method. So we have this image and we have this image. So I'm going to use it as style image. Yeah. So this is going to be the style. We're going to like map the style of this one with the style of with the contents of this, which is the person himself. So first thing to do is to load our two images. By default, you have to do that. So 
this this code does that. So the point is that first of all, we do not want the image to be very large because it should take time to train when we have a large image. We just set the maximum size of 400 here. Then we put our transforms, our normal PyTorch transforms. Then at this point now, we are discussing, we are deciding some channels. I haven't really looked at this part to know which part we're removing, but I'm sure it should be quite obvious. So now this on freeze here, the, rather on squeeze. So what on squeeze does, I think I mentioned it before. So it helps you bring out your images in batches. So you, you know, when we discussed about um, PyTorch data loader, that it returns something like this. So 32, then um, 320, then 320, then three. So I'm not really sure where, where the channel stands. I think it's either like this or like this. So some people, I think Kerazon is different from that of PyTorch. So the channel can either be at this list or end. So it just depends. But the point is that this first one is reserved for the batches. So whenever I want to use, when I, whenever I want to um, bring out my images in batches, I use this on squeeze. So generally your images are in this form here. The images are like this. They come by default like this or the other way, your batch size can be on this side at the right hand side. So whichever one it works. But the point is that if you want to then bring out images in batches, so you want to like loop through and then for each loop, you are bringing out images. You then use this on squeeze. On squeeze zero, if you have something like this now, if you have something like this, if you have an image of this size, if you have an image of this dimension, and you use on squeeze zero, so it means you want to add one to the first dimension. So you have one comma three comma this. So it means that you have one image. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So you are just making it be in batches. So that's the essence of putting on squeeze zero. You can also do on squeeze one, but this does not split it in batches at all. So this would be like this. It should make your image like this. Three, one, this, this. If you put on squeeze two, it should put one here and put your text through here. So that's how this on squeeze. So on squeeze zero basically just helps you put it in batches that you can load. So I, um, after this, this is what loads our image, then we get our image. So that's the function that does that. So this part here just makes sure that we have an image that is much more greater than 200. So now we are then going to load our star image and content image. So the essence of this shape now here is to make sure that we have exactly the same size for our content image and star image, which should be, should we should be set, we should always do that. So we don't have um, bad mixtures. Um, have I loaded this already? Oh, I haven't done this. Okay. Right. So, um, so we can get to the shape of both images. So, like I said, the whole point of that on squeeze is to make it like this. So you can do them in batches. So this um, function now is for us to convert it back to an image. So this one I'm going to squeeze definitely. So that's the essence of this one. So I'm going to put this niche in a way that can be viewed by most of our readers, like Matos Lib. Matos Lib will be able to read the images. That's the whole point of this one. So it's from converting from a tensor back to an image. So here we then just have a like few put images. Here, so this is our content image here, and this is our star image. So now we're then going to then go through what we've already mentioned here, which is the VGG19 layers. So, like I've said, this part now is where we're now going to map them together. So, as you can see, remember what I said mentioned that if you want to access this particular layer, we do VGG.0. So let me let me do it. I don't know if dot zero work. Um, model the code model. Okay, VGG. Um, VGG, I don't know where dot zero exists at all. Should this work? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is it here. So we can see the zero part of it is this first one. 
here, then one will be the menu aspect. So this is how we can access each of those layers by themselves. So this is how we can access them. So now at this point, we're then going to use the, the paper. We're going to follow the paper's procedure and map them to each of these parts. So that's what we're going to call this layer. So based on what we've said, we know we already went through each of them one after the other. So we saw that this first one is our Kong. Um, Kong one one. So we're going to use exactly what you mentioned here. So we're going to map Kong one one, Kong two one, Kong three one, Kong four one, and Kong five one. Then also we have to add the one for the content because we're going to make use of it over doing the content aspect of it. So that's Kong four two. So I'm just going to map each of them here. So this is Kong one one. Series is Kong one one. Then after max we have conv two one, which is five. After conv two one, we have ten. After ten, we have nineteen. So if you can see, it's equally the same thing: zero, five, ten, nineteen. Then after nineteen, nineteen is um one one. Nineteen is four one. Then four two is twenty one. So that's why we have this here, twenty one. Then the last one, which is five one, is um after the max point, which is twenty eight here. So these are the mapping for each of those layers. So the point is that we're going to pass our image like this. We're going to pass our image into each of them and be storing the features we get. So how is going to, what we're going to do basically now, if we still in the code, is that if you have our input image now, we pass it into the first one. The output of this first conventional side will store it somewhere because I'm going to make use of it. The output of this, sec, um, um, no, no, we're not, we're not working with two one, um, we're not working with one, two, so, the next one is comp two one. The output of this comp two one, we store it. The output of comp three one, we store it. The output of comp four one, we store it. The output of comp four two, we store it. The output of comp five one, we also store it. So we're going to make use of the outputs at each of these conventional layers. So this is exactly it now. So since we already know the particular keys that hold these particular layers that we need, we have a feature um, dictionary. So this dictionary is going to store the output of each of these layers on that particular image. So now we're going to store our image in X here. So remember that this is a function, we're going to pass our image, our model inside it. We are not going to use these layers because we already built our own layer here. So now for name and, um, does anyone have a question? Was, oh, the difference between con one, one and, so, um, when I explained the whole conventional aspect to it, remember that I said that, um, let me try and see. I said that the essence of padding, if you have a conventional layer now, that conventional, if you have just, okay, let, let me use this now. So this first one now, let's just say we have this, this side. Yeah. Well, Oh, I thought I mentioned, okay, I'll come back to this, but I mentioned the comfort side. Comfort is what we are going to use for the content side. So remember I said that all this um, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, and 5, 1. We are going to use it for the style. So this is it here. For the style aspect, we are going to use this, this, this. Um, okay, I'll just use this place. Look at it here. So this is the presentation of everything here. So what's everything here is what we are going to use for our style aspect. Then here, I don't know where, where, they, where they put it on this paper, but we can just search for it and see it. So um, VGG, 19 layer for content. So, um, I don't know if anyone mentioned this. Content. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see which one. Um, so. 
Did he mention it in this report? I'm coming. So yeah, they didn't mention it. yeah. I think this is another paper itself. So I probably take the wrong paper. So we we'll use this one instead. But you can see it now here. We can visualize information of different processing stages in this CNN. Let me zoom in so we can see it. So here they said we can visualize information of different processing stages in the CNN by reconstructing the input image from only knowing the network's response in particular layers. Reconstruct the image input so you can see we reconstruct the image input. The input image from the layers can want to. So each of these second one holds information about the image. So that's why we are making use of it. So this one holds information about the image. So all these cones, this second, the second um, layer of each conventional block holds different, and rather they hold information about the image itself. So con one one is what we use for style. Con one two is what we use for the image. So the same applies for each of those. So based on their own research and what they brought out from the paper, comfort to perform better for the content aspect of it. So for the star one, we already mentioned it here that it is one one, one um two one and so on. So up to five one. So that was used for the star part of it. So the second question I think I've forgotten it. Um yeah, different between of one and one two. So when I when I was explaining the whole convolutional aspect side, let me try and open it. Um, uh, it, it I think, yeah. So this pattern side, I think this is better to explain. It. So this was what I did when I implemented the um, batch normalization. So if you did your batch normalization, we would have seen that this is itself dot com underscore bn so that's how you can enter this in batch normalization so look at it here when in this our convolutional aspect side this is conv one this conv this is our first convolutional side here so when this is a padding you retain exactly the same image size so it means that if you want to use another convolutional aspect with the same image size you can run it again so remember that I mentioned that we won't be using our our um, conv 2D aspect to reduce the image dimension because definitely when you apply it, when you use the mathematics we spoke about the other time, it decides to reduce a bit. But why isn't padding? Because we want it to retain the same size. So it means that you have the same size. Then once you have the same size, you can decide to apply another convolutional aspect, another convolutional layer to it, and probably use padding again. So at this point, you still have exactly the same size of the image, but the depth would have increased. So the point was that we then only wanted to use max plane for reduction of the image size, but not, it doesn't have anything to do with the dimension. So that's the difference between the two of them. So if you check this now, this first one, we have exactly the same image size. This second one, we have exactly the same image size here. We have exactly the same image size too. So the point is that, this first one is the first application of the convolutional layer with our um, padding, padding of one, so probably keep it at the same size. Then this second one, so we did the same thing, and also with padding so to keep the size. But the point is that the depth of this convolutional layer keeps increasing while the dimension does not reduce. Then we then use max plane to reduce the size. So the same thing with this one, this is just the number of convolutional layers you keep adding to it. But the point is that we are not reducing the dimension. So that's just the difference between two of them. So if you look at the, the distance, BGG something, you can see exactly the same thing. This is the network summary or model summary. So this is our first one. You can see that they use padding of one. If you calculate it now, and if you pass any image, any image size to this, and you calculate this, you realize that you have exactly the same image size. So that's why they can apply another one. So if you realize, in this case, they do want to increase the, the, the um, the depth, you know, initially it was three, they increased it to 64. From 64, they could have decided to increase it to 128 or any other value they wanted, but they left it as the same. But the point is that they added another convolutional layer. But the point is that when you keep adding this thing, 
you keep increasing the number of features that keeps getting, that your model keeps getting. So padding of one now then makes sure that we have exactly the same size after this. So they use padding of one in almost all cases to make sure that our convolutional layer does not reduce in size after passing it, after passing the image to the convolutional layer. So max putting is what then reduces the dimension. So that's just the basic frame between two of them. If what well, makes sense, did it? Hello. Yes, it does. Okay, okay. So from the paper now, the point is that for our content side, just for, for this part now, okay. Let me see. Okay. So for this part now, we're just going to store the output of each of these layers. But that does not mean that we're going to use this part for our style side. Are we going to use it for our um, content side? We're not going to, we don't have anything to do with the style side. So just know that we are just using it to store the output for that particular layer. So now if you have our features, I'm going to store our features here. So just to um, re just re um, repeat what I've said before. We're going to pass our image into this first convolutional layer, which is this, the first one. You know there are two, there's Conv1 and Conv2. Two, one, two. I'm going to pass it through Conv1. Then since Conv1 is part of what is said is important for style, which is, since they mentioned that it's important for style, we're going to store the outputs of the convolutional layer somewhere. So I'm going to store it in our variable called features. We don't need this one, so I'm just going to pass and go. Then when we get to this part, we're going to store the output. Things is also needed. We're going to store the one for this one. We're going to store for this one. And the one for four two also, since we need it for the content aspect. And five one two, since we need it for the style side. So back to the code. So these are just the identifiers for it. So if you have our empty features, so this feature is also going to where we are going to store the, the features that we get. We store our image temporarily at X. So X contains our image itself. So now for name layer in model.modules.items. So this is more like iterating through each of our module. So it iterates through each of the layers of our model, where layer is the part of the model. Remember when we're doing this now. So after we finish defining all our model, um, each, each of the layers, after we finish defining each of the layers, we pass our input X. Then we pass our input X into the first part pass our input x into the second part and get our x, pass our x again into the third part. So these are just each of the layers here that are passing our x into and getting the output. So if you can, if you can return this now, you can, oh, sorry. If you can return x here, if you return x at this point, so you return the output of this layer, the final output of this layer. But you know that it does not just return this output only. It consists of this one plus this one. That it consists of these two since it is sequential one after the other, that kind of thing. So let's come to this. So and these layers are the layers are going to pass our image into. While name is the name of the other layer. So that names are this zero to thirty-six, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, up to thirty-six. So now so we pass our X which are image into the layer get the output. So now, we now want to check if the name of that particular layer is in this layer's dictionary that we have here. So if it is, it means that it's an important thing for this style transfer. So we then create it as features layer name. So what this basically just returns is either con one, one, whatever, or this, or this, or this. So this is going to be the key for these features. So, the layers of that particular name is going to be the key. So it means that for conv11, one, one, we store the output, which is the feature. Conv, when we get to the, the fifth index, remember that these are the indexes starting from zero. When we get to the fifth one, since it's part of layers, which is the condition here, we then store conv21 as the key, and then x as the features, because that's the output of the layer. So we'll, have, we'll do the same thing for each of them and we have our features. So do you, do you understand that part? Do you understand up to this point? Yes, we okay. do. 
Okay, I hope it's the same for everyone. So now we're then going to talk about the and remember we mentioned that for the style aspect of it, for the style aspect of it, we are just going to compute the correlation between each of the features in a particular CNN layer. So what that means is that for each of these layers here, so this first one, which is conv one one, conv two one, conv three one, conv four one, and conv five one, we are going to compute the correlation between each of them between the features in that particular layer. So basically, this gram matrix now is a method, is a mathematical method of actually doing that thing. So if you know what correlation is, I don't know if you've seen a cor correlation plot before. So let me just start it so we can see what it means. Correlation, uh, uh, correlation plot. Yeah, I think this, this, this describes it. Uh, yeah, this one, I like this one better. So, if you see this image now, you can see what this correlation plot helps us with. So, it makes sure that um, each of the, let's just say you have a data set, a structured data set, which is in tabular form. So, with each of these as the columns, the column, then plot a correlation between each of those features now, between all the features. So, you have the features as your X and also the features as your Y, where each of the features maps to themselves. So symbol maps with symbol at this point, symbol maps with um, normalized loss at this point, symbol or rather symbol in maps with real base at this point, it maps with length at this point, maps with width at this point, and so on. So the point is that you want to compare each of the features to each, with each other. So that's what this correlation plot just shows us. So that's exactly the same thing what we want to achieve with um, the style part. So we want to compute the correlation between each of the features in that particular convolutional layer. So that's what I'm going to do now. So um, I think I have to draw it, but I hope this thing can allow me to do it well. So, um, So who can see here? So um so if you have like an input tensor or something like this. Uh, oh. so this is like a box. Yeah. So this part is our height. Let's just see, if I want to use eight. Let me use three, since three is small. And the width is three. And the depth, so the depth, the depth is very important for each of these conventional layers. Let's just say the depth is eight at this point. So we have an image or an, an output, the output of the layer as such. Um, say something. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we'll see that, we'll, we'll see it. So, okay, let me try and see if I can just print it. Uh, So note that this is our content image. Okay, I think it's not best for me to just print features like that. Um, so you note that this content is our content image and this is our model. So that's what our features require, our image and our model. Um, okay, sorry, the dictionary. How well can I? Um, okay, I'll, I think I'll just print one of them. The yeah. So remember that um, 
remember that we we're using this as the key here so that's why i have to do it this way yeah so this is for the first composition out there this is the shape where this is the um this is the batch size then 64 is the number of features that we've gotten remember remember the model structure itself that's what you expect for the first one from 3 to 64 that's what you should expect then for the second one if you print the second one or they will have the second one in this case we'll have the next one which is uh, one comes to the fifth one here Yeah, so if you print this now, this is 128. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I hear you. Yeah, it got disconnected for a while. So, yeah. So, you can see, so this is the, but you realize that the image size is also reducing too. So, these are the features that we get from each of these layers. So that's what we stored in features. So is that clear? So you understand what the feature output looks like? Yeah, 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 it's clear now. Okay. So um, back to what we're doing. So if you have something like this now, so in our post to get what we need in order to compute the style part, for the content part, we talk about, we will talk about it, but that content is quite easy. So just let me just see what the content on does. So remember that we are talking about the content. The output of this one is just the content representation. So what we're going to do now is that for our target image now, we're going to compute different between this part, this output for our target image and our original image. So that's just going to be the different, that's just going to be our loss, which is the difference between this part and the other one. But for this style part, we cannot do anything one and that one. I know this is two one and for the target one and the original one. Yeah, we can't just do like that. We need to do this particular thing that I'm trying to show us now, which is computing the correlation between each of the features. So it's that correlation that we then use. We compare the correlation of the target part and the original one. I think like the goals that we're trying to achieve first. So you know the whole way machine learning works. Machine learning works by working with losses. So that loss is more like a difference between what you want to achieve and the original one. So that's how most things in machine learning work. So it's basically the different things from them. They then update in order for the loss to reduce. So now we have a content image and we have a style image. Then we have a last image, which is our target image. So in that post image, we need to have um, content in that target image that are equally the same or close to equal as that of as to the content in our um, content image. That's one the content of the target image should be to be um, equally the same or almost the same as that of our content side. And also want the style of our target image to be almost equal to that of our target image. So we have two losses now that we're focusing on. We have to focus on two losses. One is the loss between the target and the content, and also the loss between the target and the style. So those are the two losses we're going to focus on now. So for the content loss now, it's quite simple. All you need to do is that where you are training, but well in this case, I'm not updating weight actually, we're just updating the image, the target image. So this comfort rather, we get the features, we already have the features in this place here. So we get it for the content image here. We can see this the content image. We get comfort to of this content image. Um, where did I print it? Okay, my print is still here. Um, this is what comfort to looks like here. So this is comfort to here. So we get comfort to of our content image and get comfort to of our target image. So you know when we start initially, the target image is still learning, so it will not be close to that of the target one, of the content one. So we get the features, the, the for, um, comfort features of our target one, and comfort features of our content one, 
and find the difference between two of them. So that's what we then use to update the values of our target width, of our target image. So this time we're not updating with like um, uh, normal machine learning or neural networks. We're just updating the image itself, we're updating our target image for it to look like our content one in terms of this comfort zone here. So that's the loss for that one. So it's quite straightforward. That's what you care about. So now the main thing is now the style where we have to find the difference, which is the loss between this one for the target and that of the content. Um, the, the target between, um, and that's the content image, the style image rather. So we are going to compare the output of this one for both the target image and the style image. The same thing with this one too, the same thing with this one, the same thing with this one, and the same thing with this one. But this time around, we're not just doing it straightforward like this. Because this only gives, this does not give us the style itself. It's where we find that correlation, um, the correlation between the features, that's what gives us the style. So that's what our trials I'm trying to explain at this point now. So if you have this as the output here, so let's just say this is the output of our conv one one. So definitely it's not the output of this output one one, but let's just assume that we have our conv one one having this output. So now if you want to come, if Compute the correlation between each of the features in this particular convolutional layer. Now, how this graph matrix, which we are going to discuss now, works is that, well, first of all, note that graph matrix is a method, is a popular method that works very well. But I'm sure that there are many other ways to compute correlation between features. So you can decide to check it if you want to see other methods. But in this case, we're using graph matrix. So now, if you have this as the output, where this is the depth and this is the size of that particular feature output. So what gram matrix does is that it, um, let, let's have a, a front view of this particular block, where that front view is something like this. We're looking at this part. This is what we're looking at, the front here. So we have this, from the right, we have this. Um, um, I hope you get why this is this things like this. But this time around, I'm looking at just the rows, not the columns. So you know, because there are three rows, so that's I'm separating them into three rows. This is the first one, and the first one, second one, and third one. Then you can also decide to put the columns, which is, which will be here. Here. So you have the first column, second column, and third column. But we're not going to use the column at all. So now, what gram matrix does is that it's, um, it stacks each of these ones together as just a single line. So it flattens this, it flattens this three. So you have something like this now, where this is the first one, the first three, the second one, and the third one. I'm just going to erase this part. Now this side. So, um, do, we, do we get what I just did here? So now this one is going to just, instead of them being on top of each other, we're just going to separate them like this. Do we get what I just did now? Yeah. Okay. So that's for this first part here. That's for this first one here. We've done that for the first one. Then we then do it for the next one, which is here this one and this one so just take it as a brick as it's like a brick game or something so the next three will have it like this yeah so we keep doing the same thing so just to like know if you understand what i'm doing what should be the total um what should be the total number of rules in this meeting that we're trying to generate Eight. Yeah. Twenty-four. Okay. Uh, no, no, it's, it's going to be eight. Yes, exactly. It's going to be eight because I'm going to do it for each of these eight, this thing. So we're just going to keep doing the same thing and so on and so on. So we have this this side, the length, the the number of um, columns here, or the length or the width, rather, will be three times three, which is nine. We have nine here, and we have. Um, it's here. 
So this this is just like a representation of all the features here. Do you, you get what I'm saying? So this represents all the features. So now for us to then do the main part of this ground matrix, which is now finding a correlation, is by simply multiplying it by its transpose. So we just multiply it by exactly its transpose. So its transpose would be something like this, where you have nine here and eight here. So when you do this now, when you multiply these two things, um, can anyone just see what the total size would be? It's quite simple, Shabu. Yeah, exactly. So we have eight by eight. So now this makes sense intuitively because based on the correlation matrix I showed you the other time, this is like also doing the correlation between two things. So if you want to do the correlation between this part and every other part in it, it just handles it by multiplying it by tra its transpose, where this one multiply this one, this one, this one, this one. It also multiply everything here. So the same way our matrix multiplication works. So it means that every part of this is going to touch every part of this. So this is exactly just like finding the correlation. So that's how ground matrix works. And that's how we satisfy that condition of finding correlation between each feature in a particular um, layer. So this would be the output of it when we find the correlation. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay. So in PyTorch, you can easily just do it with that word dot view function. So just look at it here. So look at it. If you pass me a tensor, which is probably the output of one of those layers. So like dash, we don't need the batch size. So you can just put it as dash. We need the depth, the height, and the width. So with PyTorch, you can just do dot view. Since we know that the number of rows, uh, the number of rows is just the depth. You can just put it there depth and then the what they call it the width is just the height times the width we just do it like this so this is exactly completed what we need so we have this then we then find the ground matrix itself which is multiplying the tensor by its transpose then return it so that's what ground matrix does okay we don't need the cell so let me do it so we have a function that does the ground matrix for us so now putting everything together now. So now we have our content features, which is um, this. We have our content features as this. In order to get the um, our content image, in order to get the feature, so we just pass it through this function, which we already spoke about in this place here. So we have all the, um, and let me, let me, I think I should print it so we have an idea of what you have. So, mm, X for X in content features. So, um, so you can see now, so our content features now, we have the keys as all these. So these are all the keys for our content side. But note, like I've said, we do not need this part here. We do not need all these ones. There are these ones we need for the loss. So you see where we only make use of this for the content part. And for the style parts too, you can just do it like this. So it's still the same keys. So we're going to make use of this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So now, um, now that we have that, we can then find the style gram. So the style gram is now the gram matrix for each of those style features. So basically we're going to, we're going to make use of this style gram part not these features, our loss is going to be based on this style ground here. So that's just it. So we've created our, um, we've gotten our features that we're going to make use of doing this style transfer. So now our targets now, you know for our targets actually have to start from somewhere. We can try to start with an empty image. So if you start an empty image, it will take a while to train because you have to start updating everything from zero so like it can be from zero, you can decide to use random initialization, but it's quite harder to do that. So based on what they did, what they did was that they took a clone of the target image. So it's the target image itself that we're going to modify. Um, the next target image is the content image. So I'm going to be changing what we have from the content image. So it's just a good way to start actually. You can try to do whichever one you want. So I'll still print in the output here. 
So we have this like this. So now for the loss aspect now, another thing that we need to note now is that they use what they call weight. So I mean, if you if you okay for normal machine learning now, there's this thing that they, um, there's this problem which is data imbalance. So um, weight is just very very important in machine learning because it makes it makes some things have more weight than the other. So you can apply it in different parts. So if you have a, an imbalanced data set where most of the data, uh, let's just say you have a barrier class where, where most of them are zeros and you have like very few cases of one. So in order for you to balance such, you assign more weights to that one so that that one contributes more to the loss and assign more, and assign more weights and assign rather less weight to the other one so that the loss can at least be stable because you expect to have more weights, more losses on the majority class, that kind of thing. So one thing about models is that if you have a data set that has more ones than zeros, for instance, if you train the normal way, eh, your model will learn to predict ones and not learn to predict zero because when you penalize them, it's penalized more on the ones and very little on the zero. So it's more like a model thing that is very good at predicting, you know, it's naturally good. So you just use weights to balance them off. So now for this one now, first of all, there are two types of weights we are going to work with. So this first weight now is that we want to have um, bigger features of styles because you know each of all these things are different layers of the CNN. And as we keep moving forward, um, style contents get lost and we have more of the actual content we want to predict, which is more like the main content itself. So for each of these layers now, the style keeps getting lost because they are not necessary to what you want to predict. So at each of these layers, they get lost. Now for the style itself, we'll add more weight to this initial part because this part contains more of the style than these other ones. So it's good to give this, um, this weight for each of these this style weight value between zero and one. But for the later um, layers, we'll give lower weight to them because at those points, most of the style will have gone off. So we we'll want to maintain this weight at the initial start the style at the initial part. So that's why we give this one higher values of like one and this one 0 0.2. That's for the first one. Then the second weight now is that for the content loss and the style loss now, we are now going to apply what I just spoke about, about data imbalance. So when you train, in most cases, if you give them equal weights, let's just say if you give style one and content one, because of the way the model trains, you have more content than style, but that's what we want. We actually want it to be balanced. So we increase the, um, the number of the weight or how much the loss penalizes the style so that when you have our output, we'll see enough of that style that we want in that particular image, which is the target image. So we normally use this ratio method where it is just the value of the content then over the, the, um, the weight of the style. That's the weight of the content over the weight of the style. So in most cases, they want the contents to be one, then the style can be any value. But in most cases, very large value, so you can have more style. But the thing is that you just have to make sure that you don't make it too large, because if you make it too large, your output will be almost all style. But if you at least set it like zero and one is um, this is one times ten is about six. That's this one here. It gives at least a very good balance between the two of them. So that's why we, that's the essence of this weight. This weight is just like, it makes us this alpha and beta here. They call it alpha and beta. So it's for making us um, know how much of the content is going to be on the image. And so that's just the whole essence of this two weight. So now that we have that now, like I've mentioned now, the content loss is just the, um, you, if you, I don't know if you know mean square error, but basically mean square error is just your, Target minus your actual squared divided by the number of examples you have. So which is the mean itself. So you just target minus um, actual, then you square it. That's the mean square error. So you get mixes of mean square errors for each of these losses. So the content loss is the mean square error between the target features and content features, which I've said, which is quite straightforward. Then for the style part, now the style part is 
the difference between the uh, ground matrix output of the target side and the ground matrix output of the style image. So now this is the code for it. So first of all, you know what our, optimi our optimizer is, which is Adam. If you notice when we're training neural networks, it was model.fc.parameters or model.parameters because we're to update the parameters. But in this case, we're updating our target image here because we want to change the target image to have boot style content and in the uh, so boot style from the style image and content from the content image. So that's what we want to optimize it for. So now, first of all, we get our targets, our target features. So our target features, like we said, our target itself is a clone of the content image. So we first get the features from our target image now. So initially it was the content image, but now we want to be updating it. So first of all, we, the same way we train. So we first get the features of the target side. So now we have each of the features for each of those convolutional layers, com one one, com two one, com three one, com four one, com five one. So that's what this output here. So now the content loss, like I've said, is just the mean square root between that target part of com four two and that of com um of this part. Do you understand this part here? Do you understand this? Okay. No. No, I don't understand it. Well, and you should have mentioned it. But okay, what what was exactly the issue? Okay. For those on the other side, I want us to like follow along with this. So where exactly is the issue? Oh, my chat. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So uh, my confusion is with the target features and the content features. Oh, okay, the target features and the content features. So yes, like I've okay, like I've said, uh, the content. You know, we need the content image itself. The content image is there since you have to load it, and the style image, those two are there. But what you did here was that, you know, the content image now contains an image, an image structure already. So we can just create a clone. Like if you let me put it here, let me show this part here. Um, let's talk about this one. So look at it, creating a third one, which is target image and prepared for changes. So look at it, it's not like it's compulsory, but it is a good idea to start with the target image as a copy of our content image then I iteratively change its style. So it's just a clone, and it's just an initial clone of the content one, but it doesn't have anything to do with the content. That's just the point. The point is just for it to have a structure. You can decide to put it as np.0 or touch.0. So you can decide to start with all like initial values, touch.1, you can decide to start with random variables, but like it's just good to start with at least the content image. That you have to change as much as you get. Okay, yeah, I, I get it, I understand. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So then about this loss now, this loss is just, except if this feature thing that is confusing, but also that this feature are just the outputs of each of those layers. So, like I've said, I, I did. Um, um, the word for it, let me just do it again. I did something like this, X for X, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, you asked if it's too high. It says that when you are training, you keep trying different methods, but even as you said it's too high, eh, it's actually still low, because I'll show you the output that I got from this. So it's just for you to know, it's just like, um, it's just like your taste actually. It's just you want to know how much of style you want to have in that image, how much of style you want to have, or, or how much of the content you also want to have in that image. It's just like this balancer. It actually depends on you. I can decide to make more of the style to be in the image. It just totally depends on your choice, actually. So based on my, my test, when I did this, run this code, my, um, I'll show you, if I let me just show you, even though I want to show you at the end. 
Um, look at it now. If at the end of the training, uh, at the end of the training now, this is what I finally got here. So if you look at these two images, this part is gotten from the style and this image itself. So I might decide and say that, okay, like I feel like the style didn't really show well in this thing. I can then increase it the more. So that's just the whole point of the tuning or the changing of width. So that's what it just helps you do. Okay. So um, back to what we're doing here. So for X for X in here, um, content features. Oh. Um, so, so note that this editing features now, when you, when you pass it to these features, you also want to get the output for each of these layers. So now for this part now, target features equals to get features. This is the target image and this is the model which is the 16, which is the rather 19. So get features, then this then stores a dictionary where the keys are the layers and the value and the output of those layers. So now we have the output of each of the target layers. So now what we do now intuitively is that for the content side, we want to find the difference between the comfort to of our target side and comfort to of our content side. Since that's what we're using to compare the two, um, the two contents, because we know that this particular contains content of the image. So that's what we're going to use to know the different between two of them. So in this case, uh, I can actually intuitively say that the loss should be zero, like or almost zero, because we're actually starting from our our actual image itself. I don't know if you call saying. We're starting from the image, like style image, um, rather the target image is a, is a clone of the content image. So the loss will almost be zero. That's why when you're training, realize that we are actually starting from the image. And as we keep going through in the training, more of the style keeps coming up because we're then adding the style to the part of, to, to the to the target side. So not so we don't have more any almost anything to do in the content side. You can actually decide to do it the other way. Let me try and do it. I, I think what I'll do is that I'll start with the the what they call it the style this time around. You know we did a clone of the um did a clone of the content. I think I'll do a clone of the style in our training. But let me just finish with the explanation of this. So the loss is just this two. So in this case, we expect this loss to be almost zero. I think I want to print out the content for style with this content. Let's call loss. So while we're training, I want us to see this part. So, so then the style loss now. No, now remember that I said that this style loss is going to contain the style loss for each of the layers summed up. So you know that for the um for the uh, the content aspect, it was just comforting. So you did not worry about you can't add anything, it's just one. But for the content side, we're going to do the style the but for the style part, we're going to do the style loss of this one, plus the style loss of this one, plus the style loss of this one, plus the style loss of this, and plus the style loss of this. So which is what we're going to do now. So for layer in style width, so um, style width is this here. So this just these are style width here. So we're going to go through each of these one, two, three, four, um, five. So you notice that this one does not contain that comfort because we are not going to use it for this style aspect. So for layers in each of them, in the style width, then um, target features is this. So we get the features for each of those target layers. So in this case, note that at this point, comfort is omitted because of this particular iteration here. So when we get it, we then complete the ground matrix. So that ground matrix is what's important for us. So after completing our ground matrix, then this will, I'll explain why this one is just for normalization purpose or just like balancing purpose. So now our style gram would then be the style, the style gram for that particular layer. Notice that when we pass this trial, um, yeah, when, when we do this now, this gives us the, the, um, the ground matrix part for our particular targets. So we know first of all, we get our target features from this target for that particular layer. So if, for instance, we're doing convert one, it features for convert one. 
then pass into our ground matrix to get the correlation between your features in that point one one. Then now we get into that for the star aspects, we get the ground matrix for that for that particular point one one. So these are our targets and these are our actual here. So that is so from there we can then find the loss for that particular layer, which is the star width. Remember I mentioned that the star width for, for con one one we have this as our star width. We have um one because we want this one to contain more width than the lower part of it. So the star width multiplied by the mean square error between the target gram here and the star gram. So now we have the loss for that particular layer con one one. Then now we can then add it to our star loss. So the essence of this part is just to balance it or normalize it. So when we look through each of those four layers, or is it five? So zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. That's five for each of those five layers, which is for the zero um okay, let me just show it so it's for this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So we are just going to append them or just add them to this particular total style loss. So this style loss then contain the sum of each of them. So this part, like I said, is for balancing itself. Since we are summing it, we then have like an average of all those style losses for those five layers. Then we then have a total loss. This total loss is now the sum of our content loss and our style loss. So note that these are content loss and these are style loss. Why we are multiplying the weights, which is the alpha and beta that I've mentioned. So this one is one and this one is zero point, or is it one times ten for six? Something like that. So that's it. We have our dust. And we can then do our normal PyTorch process, which is optimized at zero grad, clear gradient, and then what they call is lost on backward and then optimized at step. So this is what then optimizes our so that's what we put in our optimizer. So note that when we created our target, we actually put the, we actually made it have gradient. Look at it here. When we created our target, we made it have gradient, we made it have gradient so that we can update it. So that's the end of this required grad. So first of all, like I want us to see two things from here. The first one is where um I want to say that the content loss will, I don't know, I've never done this before, but probably we should see. So the content loss, uh what am I printing? Yeah, so you can see it here. It starts at zero for each of these with it. I think I should make it better. Okay. Yeah. So you can see it here. Um this, okay now it is already made updates already. Let me start it again. That it. So you can see that the content loss starts at zero. So that's just whole point because we actually start from an initial part, which is the content loss, since there is a clone of it. So remember what I showed us that for each training, it should just be adding styles to the content to the um, target image. Which was already the content image, so you just be seeing the, um, you just be seeing the the style getting applied to it. So I also want to try so we can see that both sides work. But I think we we'll have more of the style at this point here. And style. Okay. So you can see, so this time around, it's starting from the, from the style itself. But we know basically we won't want to start with this because we definitely want to see more of the content than the style itself. So that's why it's just best to start with the content itself. So you can see, so I think in this case, we'll have to increase the weight for the content. We want to increase the weight for the content. I'll just stop it here and go back to the use of the style of our clone, rather the content of our clone. Then let me try and make, increase this. Okay. 
So like this. So this is where the I can't see this. Okay. So like when I did it, this was my final output here. So after combining this and this, I had this. So you can you can play around with it. So you can mix multiple images. You can mix any image you want. You can just try it out. So it definitely works. So yeah, yeah. So this so this makes more sense because in most cases I want to see more of the content than the style itself. So please, does anyone have any confusion or question or anything regarding it before we move to the next one, which is GANs? And it seems that GANs is quite more tricky, but it might be straightforward though. So they don't have any questions at all or any concerns. I don't have any question at all. Okay, so let's start with this NLP. So the NLP, like today we're having operation about computer vision. So next week we'll start with NLP. Then for the start of applications, um, I, I've seen some applications, I can't remember, but basically, let me see. I can actually just start it. Application of So there are many applications actually. I know you can be used in this, what they call it. You can use it in most of these um, image edit tools if you want to mix two things together. But I don't know if you can actually just check it online for other applications. I know that's the popular application for mixing things. Most of these editors, most of these um, photo editors and all. So that's one of it. Then there are some other applications too that I can't remember. So, yeah, that's it. Do, do you have any other question at all? So um, I'm coming. Okay, so um, Ken is the one that is going to be teaching the GAN this time around. Okay, so he's the one that is going to come in now.
Have a day. Good afternoon. Just stay around. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay, so let me start. Um, so I'll I'll be teaching I'll be teaching you guys about can in day. How many of us know? Can you just define by you raising your hand? In the chat, how many of us know about GAN? Are the class is quite small. Oh, wow, where's everyone? The day yeah, just okay. So, how many of us know about GAN? No one. None of us know about guns. Oh, it's interesting. <coughs> How many of us were in the uh, the machine learning class um, in the last course? Last course four. I was I was in the machine learning class. I heard about yeah. guns, but I didn't understand this. But I heard about guns. Guns, yeah. I okay. The concept of them. But, but, yeah, but you have an idea of, of what, what it does, yeah? I think generating images uh, by itself, like going from one image to another or something like that. Like, that's not, okay. I don't really, I didn't really get it then, and I've never really read of it, so. I think okay. transform, okay. I don't know if it's transform images, does it transform images at least? Like changing well, from one picture to another. No, don't worry, we'll get we'll, we'll get one that has no guns in this. <laughs> so someone else wanted to say something. Okay, um uh, my check. Yeah. Uh, so um the only thing I know about guns is um I know it just generates fake faces. That's the only thing I know about guns. Okay. It generates what faces. There are not faces, let's say, um, fake images, images that are oh, not real. Okay. okay. Okay, makes sense. Let's start. So, the thing is, um, uh, okay, let me just use the. So, I designed this slide to look more or less like a notebook. And then um, I might just be reading the things that I'm using there too. So, it's something that everyone should uh, can follow through, yeah. So, GAN is something. Generating on the serial network, that gun is something that was um, first um, explored by um, Young Goodfellow in Yusha Benjo's um, lab. That was in 2014. And since that time till now, a lot of um, advancements have um, occurred in generative adversarial, that's around generative adversarial networks have been used to do um, more complex things and even generate. Um, um, very, very, very more realistic images as compared to what it was generating, um, say, five to six years back. Right? Um, a very common example is um, generating um, text 
um, number G digits, that's the MNE data set. So one of the um, early applications of GAN is training a network that we on its own. If um, it receive, after receiving some noise, it will on its own generate an image or a realistic image out of that noise um, um, vector that we passed into it. And then another idea of application is generating uh, human faces. So you would notice here that um, these faces are not so clear, yeah? So these are one of the early um, applications of GANs. And GANs have um, expanded to um, various other things. You have things like them, fix to fix GANs. So if we um, look at this link here, it's more or less like saying you, you, you impute something. So this, this um, particular, um, should I call it model, is trained to um, generate images of cats based on um, things you draw. So you can just start any drawing here. So it's a big picture to picture um, um, generation, yeah? So you can just start any drawing here and then you should complete it to look like a cat, yeah? So you could have something like this. So um, let's say this is a cat that you want to draw. If you process it here, so downloading the model very the model that is very fine. I don't know if we can wait for this thing to complete. Should we wait? Should we wait or we should just continue? I'm interested in seeing it. Let's wait. Okay. Okay. So the idea is that it's passing this into a. Let's put it, so just think of it's passing it into a model, a model that is trained very well. So that it's able to generate images from just nowhere, yeah, based on um, experiences it has already, yeah, or based on the width that it has been able to treat. It will be able to translate this um, input image, which, which you can look at as a noise, yeah, translate it into a realistic image of a cup, yeah. Okay, so see, it's, it's, I think it's drawing the back of the cup. Am I right? So now let's say we give it a mouth and give it a nose. You can see that it's looking at like a nose, yeah? And then we give it an eye. Is it an eye? Two eyes, yeah? Is it making sense? And then we give it body. Don't laugh at my cat. I will give it leg. Okay. Is it chat? Somewhere. Okay, someone said cool. I have not seen anything about GAN. So these are these are some of the um things you can do with GAN. Okay? I think it's not limited to this on this side here yeah, you have something like this where you have an input like this right and then it converts this input into this image here right you have the one where you draw a shoe and then it generates the, an image of a shoe you draw a bag generates an image of a bag you get and so on and so forth and there are all um when i say there are um, a lot of improvements in there and i think one of the most um, recent improvement in GAN is the style GAN, which generates very, very ha um, clear, high definition images. Yeah? So you can check out style GAN. Yeah. So it's, it's a project by, uh, I think it's NVIDIA. From right, yeah. I think it's NVIDIA. So you have, <clears throat> for GAN, for, um, for um, style, uh, no, not this style transfer. Is that? No. Style GAN. Style GAN. Yeah, okay. So you see, in style GAN, you generate images as clear 
and realistic as these phones you're seeing here. <coughs> so these are things generated by GAN, GAN networks. For those of us in the other class, you um, not remember I, I referred you guys to this um, website, this person does not exist.com. Here you refresh the um, page and then it um, generates new images. So but how does this GAN um, actually work here? Yeah? So, um, if you are going to look at it um, pictorially here, yeah, this is what you'll be looking at here. Yeah? <coughs> so, for a gun to work, <coughs> sorry. Okay. For a gun to work, <coughs> the idea is that you need two different networks here. Yeah? A discriminator and a generator. Um, the idea is that um, or the, what, 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 you, what people, um, the way people look at it as, um, is in this way. You look at they look at it as the two of them are, tr are kind of playing a game of. Um, should I use? Um, let me use police and this. Yeah. So the, the idea is that this discriminator is like your regular um, neural network that um, predicts classes. Yeah. But this generator, on the other hand, does something different. It generates images out of noise. So this noise is what you call a latent, a latent sample z. So what you have is a discriminator that predicts two classes, real and fake, right? So the idea is that you want your discriminator to be able to identify real images when it sees real images and identify fake images when you see fake images. But the work of your generator is you are trying to optimize your generator such that it is able to generate realistic images close to what the um, discriminator would um, identify as real. Do you guys understand what I said now? Or should I go right again? So is it possible for like the generator to generate an image that the discriminator calls real? Is that a possibility? Like so that's 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 the point. We, the, the, the whole idea of um um the whole idea of GAN is you are training your generators such that it will be able to fool your discriminator, right? In as much as as we'll see later on, we are actually um forcing labels in the discriminator when calculating the loss. But the idea is that you want to reduce the loss of your generator when it generates an so yeah i'm going to like i said this is the latent sample here yeah? you can look at it as noise data that you're passing into your generator right your latent sample passes through your generator and what you expect is an image at the end yeah? <coughs> which you can see here a fixed sample data so now the idea is that you want to pass this list um, fake sample into this discriminator so and make sure and to Pass it through this, into this discriminator that you've trained here. Yeah? And you must have trained this generator such that this input image, which is the sample data here, would have a very, very, very low loss when compared to what the real data is. So you, what you're trying to do is that the, manage, the margin between what a real image is and what a fake image is, you're trying to reduce that gap. So in essence, what you're trying to do is that you are trying to reduce the loss of your discriminator in predicting, yeah? And then you're trying to increase kind of um, the loss here. So now you know you're generating fake images, but you want to increase it such that <coughs> it is getting towards being a real image, not a fake image. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, is it clear? I can go right again. But we'll see better in the aim as we go on though. I think I still explained it over and over. Should we move on? Um, uh, can you go by one more time before you move on? Okay. So now, I'll, I'll go over it again. The idea is this. You have a discriminator. You have a generator. The work of your discriminator is the work of your normal classifier. Classify real images from fake images. Yeah? And the work of your generator is to generate images, right? So now, what your generator is trying to do as a neural network is it's trying to generate 
images, realistic images, such that by the time your generator, your discriminator sees it, it will think it is a real image, meaning that you want to generate the loss of your generator, right? That loss <laughs> that um, tends towards generating image, um, real images, you want it to more or less like um, be very, very, very minimal. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say, right? So in, in essence, what it's trying to say, what we are trying to say is that you're trying to bring these generators to the, the width or the, yes, the width in this generator to a, a certain um, stage where <coughs> The weights are able to generate real images, irrespective of the um, latent sample, which is the um, noise image that you're passing into it, right? I don't know if I'm saying that. I mean, this virtual stuff is... <laughs> <coughs> does it make any sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Don't go on. Okay. Let me go on <coughs> to get better. <coughs> okay. So the idea of the GAN is this. You have two networks, the generator and the discriminator competing against each other, yeah? So like I said before, the generator makes fake data and passes it to the discriminator, right? Someone is writing generator on the screen. The generator makes fake data and passes it to the discriminator, right? The discriminator sees the real data and predicts if the data it received is real or fake, <laughs> right? The generator is trained to fool the discriminator. It wants the output data to look as close as possible as um, to the real training data. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the discriminator is a classifier that is trained to figure out which data is real or fake. So, uh, don't worry, we'll, go, we'll see it later on in the class. I want to go back to it, but so what ends up happening is that the generator learns to make data that is indistinguishable from the real data to the discriminator, right? And like I said before, what you pass into your generator is a random vector, which is um, the latent sample that the generator used to construct fake images, right? And it's also often called the la a, a latent vector, yeah, and so on and so forth, right? And as usual, <laughs> once you train your generator, you know the idea of GAN is that you want to train um, your generator to be able to generate realistic images. So the thing is that once you train the generator, you don't need your, need your discriminator model anymore. You can just save your generator model and then, oops, I'm not using my system. You can just train your generator model and then just keep generating images. So those um, websites you see, yeah, like, um, okay, I'll close it. Like this one and then this here. Just this two. I think these are just GitHub and repository. Yeah, what you find out there is that what they're actually using is just the generator um it's just the generator model. So they just deploy the generator model and they're making um um generating images from it, yeah, from random data and um, noise data. Yeah. So um <clears throat> in order to explain the <clears throat> mathematics a bit better, yeah, I picked up some um points from um Joseph Roca's um blog, right? So um, the idea is this is the idea of the the reason why I did this is so that you get um, more intuition to what is really happening um, between the generator and the discriminator model. <clears throat> and I will just read it out here. Yeah? <clears throat> so the training training a generator is training a generator to fool a, a discriminator invariably means yeah trying to train the generator to match the target distribution of the image, right? So what does that does that mean? It means that um, you're training the weights of your generator such that whatever it's predicting will be um, will be around the target distribution of the image. So you know your image is um, the your images are in a um, you can look at it mathematically in a particular uh, distribution. Yeah, but for your generator to be able to um, generate images in that target distribution, yeah, it invariably means that your weights, right? has to be trained such that whatever um, image it is generating will be in that target distribution, right? So now suppose we have a true dis distribution, right? For example, a one-dimensional Gaussian. And what we want to the um, generator that samples from, sorry? Suppose that we have a true distribution, for example, a one-dimensional um, Gaussian, right? 
and that we want a generator that samples from this probability distribution. <clears throat> the idea is that we want to train a method that will then consistently adjust iteratively the generator, that's the gradient descent iteration here, yeah, to correct the measured difference error between the true and the generated distribution. <clears throat> so I think all of us understand what is saying there since we are all doing deep learning and we've been doing a lot of back propagation. Is there anyone that is there anyone that doesn't understand that statement? So the idea is that there's a target distribution we want to achieve, right? So look at this um look at this image here. <clears throat> Let's say um this distribution in blue the target distribution we are trying to achieve here. Yeah? What is invariably saying is that if our generator at this point now is um, this uh, distribution um, uh, in orange here, yeah? you want to iteratively adjust the width of your generator such that whatever um, image it is going to be generating would fall within this distribution, right? So if you go through the first iteration, invariably it means that it will kind of adjust itself Closer to that distribution. If you train it again, it's going to adjust until it's perfectly. So it, it might not be so perfect here, yeah, but it will be close to perfection. Yeah, um, such that any uh, um, image it's going to be generating thereafter would be something um, within that distribution that it's um, targeting. Is it clear? <coughs> Is it clear? Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Okay, so finally, assuming the optimization process is perfect, assuming the optimization process is perfect, so now remember it says perfect, of course, it, it won't be as perfect here yeah, as, as this one is. It might, should, it, will, it might not be as perfect as this. Yeah. We should end up with the generated distribution that matches exactly the true distribution. This is a direct approach of solving the problem, yeah? So this is, this is what you would actually do um, if you know what the distribution looks like. But the truth is that uh, <clears throat> we are just humans, except if you have some um, alien mathematical skills. I don't know how you would be able to um, know the distribution of hundreds and digits. Right? I don't know how you just look at hundreds and digits and know the distribution. So that's why um, in GANs, you are using um, <clears throat> a neural network to um, you're using a neural network to kind of um, make a neural network work better, right? So you know your discriminator is able to um, identify that distribution of the image based on the weight values in that you're able to train the discriminator um, to, um, to have, yes? So if you know um, the distribution of the um, weight through your discriminator, it invariably means that you can use that discriminator to train your generator to generate realistic images by tuning the generator to um, <clears throat> get closer to the distribution that the discriminator can perceive, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's what leads us to the indirect um, method, yeah? So for the indirect approach, we assume now that this discriminator is a kind of oracle that doesn't exactly, that, that knows exactly what the true and generated distribution is and that is able, yeah. What am I saying? What we assume for now that this discriminator is a kind of oracle that knows exactly what are the true and generated distribu distributions, and that this is able, based on this information, to predict classes true or generated for every given for any given point in time. Yeah, <clears throat> if the two distributions are far apart, yeah, the discriminator will be able to classify easily and with high level of confidence, most of the points we present. If we want to pull the discriminator, we have to bring the generated distribution close to the true one, right? The discriminator will have most difficulty to predict the class when the two distributions will be equal to, equal in all points. <clears throat> in this case, for each point, there are equal chances of it being true or generated. And then the discriminator can do better by being true in one case out of the two average, right? <clears throat> Do we understand this? So this is still pointing to what I was trying to explain here. Although the only difference now is that it's written in text. So, but do we understand what um, I've been saying so far? 
before I move on. Yeah? Don't worry, we'll still start quitting. No response. We understand. Okay. <coughs> Sorry? I said we will get the idea. Okay. So now, um, let's kind of describe the architecture now, yeah? So, the architecture of the of GAN is such that the generator is a neural network that models transform function, right? So, transform function is that you are transforming um, an input latent vector into um, an image here. Yeah? It takes a simple random variable and must, and must return one string, a random, a random variable that follows the target distribution, right? So meaning that what it's returning, it's, what it should return is an image that um, is realistic, that is in the same distribution as the real image in your data set, yeah? <clears throat> as it is very complicated and unknown, we decide to model a discriminator with another neural network, right? And this neural network models a discriminative function, right? That takes as input a point and returns the output of the probability of it being true. <coughs> and once that is defined, the two networks will be trained jointly with opposing goals, right? As we'll see as we go forward. Even though this might not, might be a bit not, it might not be a, uh, so clear now. But by the time we're going to the code, it to be better. The goal of the generator is to fool the discriminator. So the generative neural network is trained to maximize the classification error, right? So meaning that it's mag maximizing the classification error. It's trying to. Um, so now you know your discriminator is um, trying to predict, um, trying to differentiate real from fake. But you are trying to make your generator, you are trying to force your generator to change those fake images to real images, right? So meaning that if you are going to be taking those real images to your discriminator, the loss will be quite large. Because it's, it's, if, 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 you're, if, you're, if you already know what your real image is and your fake image is, it invariably means that you want the loss for your fake images to be high why the loss for your real images to be very low, right? So if your the loss for your real for your um, for your fake images in your um, discriminator is high, it means that your generator is generating images that are close to what the real images are. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, let me just go. So Come me again. Okay. So I said that. So I said that. Um, can I remember what I said? Okay. I think I said that the idea is that you want your generator to generate images such that by the time your um, discriminator is seeing those fake images, it will not be able to classify them as fake images. Yeah. The the loss, you know, like. Like I said here, you are maximizing, you are maximizing the final classification error here, yeah? or like what we've been doing um, before, where we minimize the error. You are maximizing the error for your generator such that by the time your discriminator is seeing it, it's 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 not seeing it as it's seeing it as something with a very high error because now you know your discriminator predicts fake and real. Yeah, you know what your real images are as labels. You know what your fake images are as labels. You don't want your discriminator to see fake images as fake images. You want to maximize the error of your generator such that when you pass in a fake image to your, gen your discriminator, your discriminator would see it as large error, yeah? And be, and be like, okay. It's, and at that point, you, what you should do to then say is that, okay, it's getting closer to um, what the real images are, right? Is it better? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so going forward, the goal of the discriminator is to detect fake generated data, data so that the discriminative neural network is trained to minimize the final error. Yeah? 
Okay, so let me just jump to this. So the idea is this. This is your loss function for the discriminator, yeah? So the, the, the loss function is such that, um, I hope it's not too big. So the loss function is such that you want to find the error um, from your discriminator, that's the, real, the, the loss from your discriminator, and the loss from your generator, right? And add it up. That's what causes. That's what uh, makes up the loss function for your discriminator. It's not just the loss from your discriminator alone. Don't worry. You, it will. It will be better by the time I show you the code. So just put this in mind that you are taking the loss from your discriminator, right? That's with real images. You are taking the loss from the discriminator with real images, and the loss from the generator with real, um, fake image from the generator with fake images. And you are adding it up together to cost to um, generate, uh, to get your loss function that you use to train your discriminator, right? So this is it. Invariably <laughs> means you're maximizing your generator loss and then minimizing your discriminator loss. Um, so that's, I think that's enough for this story. We can start with code now, yeah? Are we set? Uh, I have one question. Okay. So the loss, the loss uh, maximizes and minimizes, maximizes the and generator minimizes this discriminator, right? Yeah. So the loss function now, I, I still trying to keep it, I still attempt to make the total loss function zero, like normal machine learning, like the generator loss function plus the discriminator loss function. Is the idea to make it zero, like when you join it together? I don't know if my question is. So the idea is, is to, the idea of it is to kind of, um, um, how do I put it now? Maybe I didn't get your question better. So like when you say the, same, mm -hmm. the, the loss function now is, the, is an addition of the generator okay, so, and the discrete. So the idea of um, the idea of um, G um, GANs is not really um, is not really what you would see in the normal classic, um, classic um, classification problems and all that. It's I'm okay, listening. it's like my brother wants to do something, but okay. So it's, it's not like the normal um, <clears throat> classification problem. So here we are not trying to make your discriminator good at predicting something. You're trying to bring your generator to the distribution of what the real images are, right? So it's not, you won't really look at it the way you're looking at it now, right? You're not trying to uh, make your discriminator good at predicting any class. It's a different um, objective. You're trying to make your generator generate better images. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So look at it that you are bringing, like I said, <coughs> up here. <coughs> look at it that you are trying to bring this orange guy to be in the same distribution as this blue guy, right? Yeah. So don't look at it as a normal classification problem where you, you're trying to reduce um, loss. Okay, my brother wants to say something. Let him say. Okay, so if I get your question currently, it seems like you want to know if we are still optimizing or finding, making the loss zero. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, something I, like that, like the total loss. Oh, okay. okay. So the like thing is that, from what he has explained, although you see more of it in the code, is that your discriminator and your generator, they are actually two different networks. Okay, yeah. So for your discriminator now, you want your discriminator to be able to know fake images and no real images. So you definitely give them classes. So you can see one for real images, zero for fake images. So yeah. your model, your discriminator will learn to do that. For your generator, so the point now is that for that one now, the loss at that point, would you want to make the, um, the you know what loss is now? Loss is just the difference between what nice. you want and what you got. So that's the point. For the discriminator, we are going to be minimizing that loss. So you are minimizing to so if you give me a fake, if you give it a real image, and let's just say your your discriminator predicts 0 0.5 and the actual value is one. So the loss is 0 0.5. If your predicted predict 0 0.5 and the actual loss value rather that is that is meant to get is zero, meaning that is a fake image, the loss is 0 0.5. So the point is that you are minimizing that loss. Then for the generator now, like he has said already, the generator now, it has its own loss, but it's not related to 
the discriminator at that point. There's a relationship, but its own loss is, is separate. So, like you said, you want to maximize it. So, if you've seen the code now, I think we we'll explain more of it in the, in the code itself. But the point is that you cannot use the discriminator loss for the generator loss. You cannot optimize it the same way you optimize it. So, the discriminator will tell you how bad um, it degenerated or generated an image. So, it has its own loss. So, you are now going to use that loss to minimize it. But this time around, they're not minimizing it the same way you minimize the, um, the what they call it, the discriminator loss. Like I've said, if you passed in a fake image and your discriminator predicted 0 0.5, so the loss is 0 0.5 minus 0. That's the loss. But for the generator this time around, the, the loss would be in the upward form. It would be like the field version of it. So if you're predicting, you, your generator wants its output to be actually one because that's what it's looking for. So if your um, if your discriminator said that it's a fake image by 0 0.2, let's just say your discriminator knows fake images very well and it gives a value of 0 0.2 for fake images. If you're optimizing for discriminator loss, it's be 0 0.2 minus 0. But for the generator, it's not be 0 0.2 minus 0. It's be 0 0.2 minus 1. So it's really the absolute one. So you can see that it's very large. So in that case, it's like 0 0.8. Because this time around, you want your um, generator to tend towards one, which is the actual image itself. So I'll just leave it like that. So you, you understand more of it from the code. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. <clears throat> I actually wanted to go through. I didn't want to run the code because at the point of training, it might take some time. So I saved the um okay can you okay i'll just um i was think i'm thinking of uploading the model i train yeah so we'll just see the result because we are going to go um through we, we start training here yeah, it might be take some time. Okay, so sorry. Let me just um, upload the model. Yeah. Excuse help me upload this part. I think I kept it here. Yeah. So just check my file. So just connect and check my files. You see the name in the okay. Sorry. So um let's start. Of course we know about <coughs> we know that we need to import all this here. Yeah? And then um of course like I said we are using um the NIST data set here yeah? and we are using a batch size of um of sixty four. Right, we transform it to 10 files and then we download the data set, MNIST data set. <coughs> now, what <coughs> you should also notice that for um, generative models, we don't care about, um, it's, it, remember I said it's not a classification problem, right? So if you're going to be doing um, generation of um, hundreds in digits, it means all the images you have there are hundreds in digits. You're not classifying whether it's one or two or three. It's not a classification problem, right? So similarly, if you are going to be doing building a GAN that generates spaces, it means what you would have in your data set those spaces, yeah? So we, for now, we don't really care about um, the labels. The labels is something we would actually um, um, put in by ourselves as you see it in code, yeah? So then we use that, do our normal data loader, we instantiate our data loader, right? And then we run all that. So this, I wrote um, a little note here <coughs> for those of us who would want to understand <coughs> more about um, this num number of workers, batch size, and epoch, and the rest, and how it actually works. So it's just for us to read it on our own, yeah? So now we can take out one sample. Remember, our data loader is going to be giving us um, a batch of 64 images, yeah? So we can just pick out one image from this from the batch of the four that contains a batch here, yeah, which contains four images and plus. 
So you see it's um, in digit five here. It's just to show us what is inside the data set, right? And define our model. <coughs> right? So this is what it is. We are going to be having um, a discriminator, right? And then a generator. And um, in our model, right? Or in our network, rather, you have your generator feeding in fake images to the discriminator. As, and likewise, you're having um, your MNS data set, you're passing in your MNS data set into the discriminator already also. And like we have said before, the work of your um, discriminator is to identify um, real and fake images. But there are some things you should notice here. Um, for generative as a server network, um, the normal ReLU function doesn't actually really work. What you would rather have is um, a, a leaky ReLU, yeah? Because <coughs> there is the idea of leaky ReLU is that it allows them a fast flow gradient, right? Quite a complex thing, but the idea is that it doesn't really um, point to zero. If you notice, if you zoom this better, you find out that on like your normal ReLU, right? Um, where is it? Sorry, I'm trying to um, show something. Um, unlike your normal ReLU, this doesn't actually point to zero. <laughs> it kind of allows um, for the backward flow of um, gradient, yeah? And then for your generator, what the researchers also found to work best is um, a cache that can hit um, output kind of um, works best when you're um, dealing with um, um, gen um, know, generative adversarial network. So it's it's something that they um, found out during their research here. Um, although I'm not sure there's any much mathematical explanation to it here. Oh, there should be though. Maybe I've not done my research work. Right. So we are going to define the discriminator model, right? and then the generator model. And then we'll define the train process, how we want the generator and the discriminator to communicate, right? Um, if you want to read more about leaky ReLU activation functions, you can get this is um, a link here, right? So unlike, like I said, unlike the normal ReLU that we'll be, you guys must have been using, <coughs> for generative by the Sarah networks, we'll be using leaky, leaky ReLU, yeah. So we have a note here that a leaky ReLU is like the normal ReLU, except that there's a small non-zero output for, for negative increase values, right? So that's what you will notice in this um, in this graph here. And then um, for generative as a Sarah networks, we are not going to be doing a sigmoid at the end of um, the network. Rather, what we'll be considering is the logic um, is the logic from the training process. And what we'll be using after getting the logit is the BCE with logit loss, yeah? So it's, it's basically your sigmoid and your cross entropy loss together, right? So that's what you have in this BCE, BCE with um, logit loss. So that's what you will use to calculate the loss of your, uh, um, of your, of your outputs, right? <clears throat> so now this is what the um, discriminator looks like. So um, for this example, we are not doing, okay, this is like a very simple example. So we are just going to be using linear, um, a linear model, a linear architecture, right? So um, for the discriminator, of course, we know that our input is what is an image, right? <laughs> and um, for the MNIST data set, it's a 28 by 28 image, right? And um, we can just build it. They are fully connected. I think. So your input image, what you want as your output. Your so of course, I'm sure. Like only would have thought everyone has to build neural networks, right? So I think everyone is cool with what they are saying here, right? So we have our first fully connected layer, <laughs> which accepts the input. We have the second fully connected layer, which is a hidden layer. Yeah. We have how many hidden layers do we have? Sorry. Let me ask, how many hidden layers do we have? Two. Two? Sure it's two. 
А еще есть Су. Все, три. Someone else to answer. I don't want to only one person. I think I've been talking since. I think it's just two. I think, I, I, I think it's three. Okay. Precious is three. Ulua Fayo, Charles, Ulua Femi, Priz, Sharon. Missing for your answer. I think it's three too. Okay. How many? Three. Okay. So it's three, yeah? So I think you were joining. Who is talking? Sorry. I think you are judging based on the layers. Layers are different from that's the um, those um, FC one, FC two, FC three. Not not that one. The hidden layers are what we are passing into those linear layers. So instead of counting the layer layers, count the hidden layers. So you have the input, the hidden one multiplied by four, the hidden one multiplied by two, and the hidden one. So those are the three hidden layers there. Makes sense. Are we cool? Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, this input is going to pass something to this guy here. This guy is going to pass something to this guy here. This guy is going to pass something to this guy here. This guy will then give an output, right? So we have one, two, three, right? And then we have, we can we just instantiated our dropout and we, we said it's 0 0.3. So what is the dropout used for? Randomly shut down weights. So what's the essence of a dropout? Huh? What's the essence of a dropout? Uh, ah, this is only teach about dropout. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Um, to prevent. Uh, uh, so I, I think dropout is. Um, okay. Okay, I said. Um, I think dropout is for um, a way of avoiding overfitting. Yeah, that's right. Dropout kind of over, um, uh, prevents overfitting of your model. Yeah. Yeah. Someone is speaking. So. Okay. So let's move on. <clears throat> so um so we can go ahead to define the um forward um function, yeah. So our forward function as we have said, of course, you know you will have to flatten the image that you're receiving, right? Your forward function will consist of um you're passing your input data into the um, um, your fully connected layer one, right? And then you define that. So now remember, I told you guys that the leaky, the difference between the normal regular and leaky regular is that it is small um, negative slope, right? So here we are just defining um, what that negative slope should look like, right? So we are saying negative slope should be of zero point two, right? And then yeah, it's a leaky ReLU. We pass that through dropout, right? So you can define your model how you want to define it. So um, there, like I said, the things you need to notice is that there is a leaky ReLU. Yeah. Um, so yeah, define your forward process and then your output. So notice here in your output, you are not doing anything sigmoid at all or any of such. We are considering the logic, right, in the output. Uh, in the other hand, what we would have as a generator is kind of something, it's kind of the inverse of what you have in your discriminator. So the way I always see it here, if you go back to, I think the image is done. If you go back to, the way I see it, I always see it is that the discriminator is trying to shrink um, the size of your, of your image. 
to um, what you have as um, your logic. Yeah? Well, your, your generator is trying to trying to bring it from that image to uh, from that um, um, latent vector, right? To what should be an image, right? So if you have to think from the top of your head, what do you think the size of your generate the output of your generator would be? Yes, it should be ten classes. No, remember I told you we are not. Um, it's not a classification problem. Okay. Right. So now I'm passing. I'm, pass, I'm passing in um, a random data, a random vector, yeah, a latent vector z, yeah, and into my generator. And like I've told you before, my generator is good at so what? Uh, just to say. In, Exactly. Okay. So before you can answer that question, you need to understand what that generator does before you know the output. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure I, I said it in the beginning, I've been saying it over. So I want you guys to kind of um, think, what do, you, what do you think the output of this generator would be? Look at this image that you're looking at now. What do you, what do you want the output of your generator to be? Uh, a real image. That's it. So you want your, your generator to output an image, yeah? So now if I'm saying that, if I'm saying that, um, if I'm saying, okay, for this very simple case, yeah, it might not be the case for more complex mood and algorithms like Stylegan and the rest. If I'm saying that my input image is a 28 by 28 image, yeah? What do you think would be the size of the output image of the generator? Yeah, that's right. So that's the essence of that. That's the whole point of everything. You are building a generator to generate images. So that the, the question is, how do you make the generator to generate images? Like you have always known, like you have always done, you know that it has to, it's, it's something that has to do with the weight values of your generator. Right, so we just have to find a way to make the generator with the storage that it can generate images. Right, so all those um, talk I was talking about the distribution and all that, it's all boils down to what are the weight values that you have actually, you have put you have set for your generator and what are the weight values that are in your discriminator that your discriminator has been able to learn. Do you understand? Right. Okay. So um, let's go back. So now, <clears throat> similarly, what you would have is an input, um, an input, yeah? <clears throat> so I, what you 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 see in the rest of this is that the input latent vector was of size 100. This was just any random um, size, right? And <clears throat> what you'll find out is that in the, in, as you go on is that the output size of this, um, of this network is of size 28 by 20, right? That's 784, if I'm not wrong, right? <clears throat> and like I told you before, you want the output of your generator to pass through the tanch activation, right? So we understand what is happening, and then notice we are still using leaky red okay? So you kind of find out that it's kind of the opposite of what the generator is doing. The generator is more or less like, uh, this might be a, a very bad use of the word, yeah, but Look at it like a decoder and then encoder. So the, the, the that's not the right to use the word. Let just pass that as want to But the generator is trying to reduce it to classify, kind of classify, but the generator is trying to um, expand that little vector to generate what should be an image, right? <clears throat> then we define our hyperparameters, right? So, um, Define the input size. Of course, we know the input is to the discriminator is um, is 28 by 28. I notice that okay, I think I didn't write this. So it's 28 by 28 image. Right? The output size of the discriminator is is just one. You are just having one output because you are not classifying anything. You get it. It, it is the same image. They are all. So what you are passing through your um, discriminator would be a set of images, right? As we'll see later, I'll, I'll explain it better, better as you go down. Then you have um, hidden layer. This is what we use to construct hidden layers, yeah? 
and then that's the number of nodes in the EVM. Okay? And then um, we have the latent vector. <coughs> so remember what the latent vector is. It starts random stuff that we use, we pass into the generator. So we took 500, right? And um, so meaning that it's what? 10 by 10, right? The 10 by 10 stuff. Then you have um, your discriminator output, right? This is your generator output, sorry. This is not your discriminator output. So this is your generator output here, yeah? and the size of the hidden layer of your generator. We are cool, yeah? So now we in initialize the different um, classes that we have um, earlier um, defined. Um, let me see if my brother has uploaded this. He hasn't uploaded it. Sorry, give me one second before my system goes up. I need to upload the model. Um, um, Okay, so I'm back. So, um, like I was saying, we did instantiate the discriminator and generator <coughs> and set them in variables D and G. <coughs> and if we print it, we see what um, the model looks like. Yeah, the, what the architecture looks like for the generator and the discriminator. So now we see that we have um, an input feature of 7H4. And what we are having at the output is one. So for the generator, we have an input feature of 100. And what we are having at the output is 784. So we are trying to generate an image of 8 by 78 here. <coughs> so I, I, I kind of moved this to GP because I wanted it to print faster. Right? So this is, if you want to move your, um, your models, your model architecture, just to um, GP. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you move this to your don't worry, I don't matter. Okay, I'm still trying to sort out the issue of the model, but it does it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'll just go on. So for the discriminator, like I said before. So that the idea is this. We want to kind of, so what that, remember that equation I was showing you guys above, right? <clears throat> it was more or less like a total loss, which is the sum of the real loss and the fake loss. So what do I mean by real loss? The idea of the real loss is that, you know, um, we did not mix fake images with um, real images. And then we now started um, putting the loss with how it kind of works for the um, for your generative adversarial network is that <clears throat> you first of all pass your real images to through your um, generator, it's through your discriminator, right? And then you get the loss. Already you know what the label of your of that particular um, fault process is. Of course, you know the label should be one because it's real images. Then you generate um, Take images, you um, generate random um, latent vector, pass it through your generator, right? Generate fake images. That fake image now <coughs> that you've gotten, you pass it through your discriminator and you get a loss, 
right? The loss that you got is what you have as the fake loss. Of course, you know what it should be. You should be, you, you assign a level of zero to it. So that loss plus the loss of your, the real loss that you have, you add it together, that forms the loss, um, the loss of your discriminator. So that is what you are going to use to do your back propagation, right? So <clears throat> doing this iteratively kind of tunes your discriminator better to, um, to kind of, um, how do I put it? Make your generator learn to um, generate better images. Let's just go on. I'll still explain it better. Again. So remember that we want the discriminator to have put one for real image, images and zero for fake images. So we need to set up the loss. Okay. So already I said that. And then remember, um, I said that we are going to be using BCE with logic loss. So like I showed you in the um, architectural book, <clears throat> we are not doing any stigma in that output. We are taking the logic loss as it is. That's what we are going to use for the real loss, <clears throat> to calculate the real loss, yeah? Um, then there's something. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the norm, so the normalized version of your ME, um, image data set is actually um, within zero and one. <clears throat> But for the researchers who did, um, for the researchers who worked on GANs, <clears throat> what they noticed that is that GANs work better when you have your images normalized between minus one and one. Of course, I'll assume everyone knows what normalization is, yeah? So GANs kind of work better when your normalization is between zero and one. So what you would, you would find out when we start training is that we converted the input images first. We converted them to um, be within the range of, um, the, the normalization to be within the range of minus um, one and one, yeah? And that's the same thing we used for uh, um, the generator images, yeah? <coughs> so the output of our generator images would be within the range minus zero and one, right? So I would have to read this. <coughs> So for the real images, we want um, D of real images to be one, right? This makes a lot of sense. We are passing in real images to the discriminator. Of course, your label for those should be one, right? And we want the discriminator to classify the real images within label one, <coughs> indicating that these are real. To help the discriminator generalize better, the labels are reduced a bit from one to minus one. So this is what you call smoothness. <clears throat> so it's just all for the um, for the goal of um, generalizing. Yeah, you don't want it to be a perfect one. It doesn't mean that if you use one, it won't work. One would, would work, but as usual, um, your model will kind of generalize better when you use something slightly different from one. Right? Remember, I told you you are not you are not forcing your you are not you are not creating a model to classify you're creating a model that would bring your generator to be within in the same distribution as your um, images you get so for this we'll do the parameter smooth smooth yeah if true if true we'll should be um, smooth our label so you see this later in the code here um the discriminator loss for big data is similar so we want when you pass you want it so what you are going to do is that you want your discriminator to see fake images as fake and you want the labels to be zero, right? You want it to force it, you want to force it to be zero, right? Okay, so um, the generator loss on the other side. So the generator loss, loss will look similar to, similar only with flip labels. So now, remember I told you that the generator is trying to um, generate images such that um, the discriminator will think it's a real image, right? And the discriminator on the other hand is trying to differentiate between real images and fake images when it sees them. Now, remember that your loss here is saying, if you pass a fake label, fake image to this discriminator, the label is zero. So anything that is um, trying to make it one, make the loss large that it is zero. But on the other hand, see what your um, generator is trying to do. The generator is saying, if you pass a fake image to the discriminator, I want that fake image to be identified as one. 
Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. So in this case, the label will be flipped, right? To represent that the generator is trying to put the discriminator into thinking that the images generated are the images generated are fake, are real rather. So I'm trying to uh, put the discriminator to think that the fake um, images are real, right? So this is what um, the codes to calculate our loss would look like. So now I told you it is not classification, right? We know what our images are. So what you have is um, when you pass in the output of your discriminator, right? <clears throat> Of course, the output of your discriminator would be um, will have the same size as your batch size, right? Because you know you are passing in 64 a batch of 64 images into your to your um, your uh, model here, yeah? and meaning that the output will also be 64, right? So we create um, the outs to be our size. So sorry, we we get the batch size of our image, right? From the, what we have in the D out, right? Uh, and then we create labels. Now we are creating the labels ourselves. So now notice that if you want to, if you don't have, if you don't want to use smoothing, you can just pass um, false, right? For the smooth parameter, meaning that it won't um, use 0 0.9. So what you have here now is that you are now generating your labels for those, um, for those, um, what they call it batch of 64 images, real images that you pass into your distributor. And then you are assigning 0 0.1. And for smooth labels, you are assigning 0 0.1. For, but for, if you're not doing smoothly, you are assigning one to it, right? So that's what you have in your, um, in your vector of labels, right? Um, now, now that you have this in your vector of labels, you can then pass in your outputs, right? From your discriminator and the label into your BCE with logit loss. So remember, this is your logit, yeah? So you're passing your logit and your label. So remember what I, what I told you about BCE with logit loss, yeah? It's more or less like you are doing your um, sigmoid and then you're doing your cross entropy loss together. So that gives us the loss here, right? So this is our loss, the real loss. This is more or less like um, how far is our output from what this prediction um, from from this level of one, right? That you have always been doing in your um, in your um, classification problem. But in this case, you're having just one level of one. But now for the second level, you are passing your D out. So notice that this is fake loss. The idea is that this D out will be actually um, what you'll be having here is um, results from fake images you passed into your discriminator, right? So this D out, <laughs> like you have done earlier, now there's nothing like smoothing here. You are going to be creating your labels also, but this time around your labels are zero because they are fake images that you, are passing, you have already passed into your discriminator. And then like you did above, you are going to pass it into your BC with logic loss, and then you get your loss. And then the idea is that for you to train, do back propagation on your discriminator, you are going to be adding these two losses together. So this, this is what you would use to train your, um, to train your discriminator, right? And then we choose our optimizer and learn it, yeah? So we're using Adam as the optimizer for the discriminator and for the generator. So notice that we're using two different optimizers. We are instantiating two different optimizers, so there is no conflict because your discriminator um, network is different from your generator network, right? Okay, so now this is what the training process will be like. So your training will involve alternating between the training the discriminator and the generator, right? Um, and we'll use functions, real loss and fake loss to help us calculate the discriminator loss in the following cases. So now, for in training your discriminator, you would compute the discriminator loss on the real training images, right? Then you generate fake images. You compute, compute also the discriminator loss on the fake generated images. Then you add up the real and the fake images. And perform back for those optimizations to the, um, update the discriminator's weight. So this is what happens for the discriminator. Just after doing that, <clears throat> yeah, notice that your discriminator would have um, learned some things from this test it has done, right? Then you now use your generator to generate fake images, right? 
then you compute the discriminator loss on the fake images using flipped label. Yeah? When you compute the discriminator loss, this um, loss is now what you use to perform back propagation on your generator width. So one way or the other, whatever the discriminator has learned from this step above, is one way or the other going to be translated into what is going to be here, right? So now your discriminator is getting good at, um, as you're training, your discriminator is getting good at differentiating between real images and fake images right here, right? So now at this point, your discriminator, your, you passed your, um, you passed fake images into your discriminator, meaning that your discriminator of course know that this image is fake. Now, the loss you get from this, you compute, no, the loss you get from this would give, would give your generator a sense of how far away it is from making realistic images. Do you get? Are we clear? I need response. Well, no response. The training process seems very confusing. Should I go by it again? Yes, please. Okay. So I'll start again. <laughs> so now you have your discriminator here, right? This is how you train your discriminator. First, you know, um, we know what the discriminator, we know what the real images are, and we know what the fake images are, right? So, of course, um, it would have been good to just bring the two of them together and then just calculate the law. And you know, from, your, from, the, from what you guys have been learning, you are training your discriminator to be able to differentiate between real images and fake images, right? So now, we get real images, and we pass the real images through the discriminator and we calculate the loss. Then we tell the image, in calculating the loss, we are telling the discriminator that these are real images you get. These are real images. Account this, in, put into account, or put this into account when you are um, doing back pro propagation through the loss, yeah? Then you generate fake images with your generator. And then you pass those fake images through your discriminator. And then you tell your discriminator, these are fake images. Though. Take this into account when you are doing back propagation. But now, you take these two losses that you have generated, the discriminator loss, and the, the discriminator loss on real images and discriminator loss on fake images. You add them up together, right? And you use this to do back propagation on your discriminator. That way, your discriminator is being, it, it, it will get better at this differentiating between real images and fake images. Am I right? Do you guys understand that up to this point? Yeah. Clear, yeah? Yeah, I can. I need to be able to say it clear. Just one person. I understand, I understand. Okay, okay. So now, on the other side, we have a generator network, right? Which is just there to generate fake images. And remember that the idea of the generator is that we want the generator to be good at generating images that look like the real image, yeah? So now, this discriminator, one way or the other, is getting good at differentiating between real images and fake images. Am I right? So now when you generate fake images, you want to pass that fake image that you generated through the discriminator law, right? Now, you are not just passing it so that the discriminator will say these are fake images. You want to see the loss. You want to know how far away it is, right? From, um, um, how far away it is from getting closer to what a real image should be. That is why you're using a flipped label here. Do we understand? So now, if you are, now remember I said we are maximizing, we are not minimizing now. To minimize the loss, you are going to be using the actual label of, label of um, zero. But now we are using flipped labels of one. We want to maximize the error. Yeah? 
We want to maximize the classification error. That's why we are using deep flavor. So we are not saying this discriminator is good at generating and um, differentiating between um, real images and fake images. Let's see how well it um, um, differentiates between these fake images the generator has generated. So you pass the generated images from your generator into the discriminator, <coughs> and then it gives you a loss. So, but now your loss is not based on is zero. You are seeing how far it is from being one not how far it is from being zero. So that's where you are seeing the idea of kick labels. You want to know how far it is from being one, how far it is from being a true image. Do you get that now? <laughs> so now when you have that loss, yeah, why do I have to kill some quick images? So when you have that loss, you can then use that loss to do a back propagation on your generator's width to improve your generator in the next iteration. Is it better now? Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. Okay, makes sense. So I think it's with that. If you're able to understand what I said here, then you understand the whole the whole thing. Basically, this is this is what I really wanted everyone to understand. So one way or the other, you see, I'm sure that picture of bringing your um <coughs> bringing your generator to be in the same distribution of your dis um, the same distribution of your image. This is where it plays. It, I think it should you should you should get more lighting. The intuition should um, be clearer at this point, yeah? Um, okay, so now in training, this is what we just do. We want um, to use um, an epoch number of 100, yeah? We also want to see um, the images that are generated. So we want to have an idea of the sample of what the images look like during the training process. And also the loss of the generated image and the of the loss of the generator and the discriminator and the different stages here. Um, so now this is a sample size of 16 years. So what this is just trying to do is you know we are we um we are going to use this later on in the um um in the um code. So the this is just a fixed this is just a fixed um a fixed um, latent vector, yeah? So the idea is this, at this stage, you want to be making, um, generating images from this fixed um, latent vector so that you just keep track of what the images turn out to be after, after as, the, as the generator gets better, right? So you are going to be saving this fixed um, latent vector in, in your samples, yeah? You're going to be saving it in your samples, right? So that's just for visualization purpose, right? So now we initialize the, um, we set the discriminator and um, generator to training mode, right? And then we define our iterated process. So we are saying for epochs in range, the number of epochs we set, yeah? We want to get some information from the of course, we don't have labels yet, so we are picking the batch number and the real image. Yeah, so the batch size is you can get the batch size from the number of image, and in our case, it's 64 because we set the batch size of 64 when defining the train loader. Yeah, and then remember, I told you that, um, <clears throat> of course, the images coming out from here from the train loader, train loaders have been normalized to be within the range one to zero, right. So, but, um, like I said before, um, GANs kind of work better when your normalization is between minus one and one, right? So this simple function here brings your um, normalization to be within the range minus one and um, one, right? So they'll just multiply the image by two and minus one, yeah? But there are some other ones. I think I saw one other one. The other one that can be used. I'll probably check it out and send that to you guys. Then our optimizer set it to zero grad, yeah? And then I want to train on GPU. So now this is where all the things we've been seeing in my book comes into play. So now we pass our real images. Remember what is coming here is what? Real images. We have not said anything about fake images, yeah? So we pass our real images into the discriminator. Right? And then we get an output, which is what? I'm sure I said it. So someone should tell me what this output is. Oops. Oops, 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 oops. 
Okay, so someone should tell me what this output is. What is, your, is, on what, is in what form? Is it in probability form? What, what form is it? Probability form. It's the wrong one. Are you sure it's in probability form? What makes, what makes the output of your network be in probability form? If, if there's no sigma, if there's no activation function. But you know, remember I told you that um, <clears throat> we are not passing it through a sigmoid function. They're not passing the output through a sigmoid function. So it's your logic. It's just the raw output from your network. It's your logic. So that's why we are passing the logic into your BCE with logic, yeah? So it's going to do your sigmoid and then your cross entropy loss. Right? So now this is your logic. And you pass your logic into your real loss function that we have defined before. And we set smooth so true. So we define this above, right? And then, of course, remember what you said, this is what it looks like, for those of us who have forgotten, yeah? So we know that the label is one, so we force the labels to be one. But now we set smoothing into true, to be true, so we, it's, not, it's not one, it's 0 0.9. So it's just to smoothen out the loss, <laughs> yeah? So we calculate the loss. How far is this from being one, yeah? And then, we, I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say. So we calculate the loss at this point, yeah? So this is our real loss, discriminator real loss. And then we go ahead to train the, the, the uh, generator. No, not train the generator. We go ahead to generate images from the generator, right? So now, we have not trained the generator yet. Though. We just pass in uniform, um, a uniform distribution latent vector, right? Of the size of our batch size. So we are seeing 64 um, random um, latent vectors, yeah? We are passing it into our generator. So now we, we are expect what we want, we expect is that your generator should generate real images. Yeah, something close to real images. Or would, 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 would um, name them as fake images for now, yeah? So now we get these fake images, yeah? Pass it again into our discriminator, right? The output again is going to be a logic, right? So now we calculate the loss of these fake images, and this is the D fake loss, and then we add it up. So this is the loss that we would use to do backward propagation on our discriminator uh, model. Does it make sense? At least it's very, this is the same thing that we said over here. Sorry? That's it. Well, someone saying something. Is it clear, guys? Is it clear? Is it clear? Yeah. It's clear, yeah? So it's just the same thing we said before. You pass your, you pass your real images to the discriminator. The discriminator brings out the logic to calculate the loss. You keep it at one point. You are not yet done with calculating the loss. You pass your um, generator. You pass your the images, the fake images generated by your generator into your discriminator again. You save it as fake loss. You save it as defect, yeah? yeah? You calculate the loss, keep it as defect loss, yeah? Then you add the two losses together and use the um, result of this addition to then do back propagation on your um, discriminator network. So that way, your discriminator will be getting better at differentiating between real images and fake images. Make sense? So this is, this is similar to your normal classification. It's more or less like you're training your discriminator to be good at classifying between real images and fake images. Yeah? Cool. Are we cool? Yes, I think so. Okay. So now, on the other hand, you would have your, um, okay, so we set our optimizer, the um, generator optimizer to zero grad, yeah? And then we generate random images. 
not random images, rather, we generate random latent vectors, yeah, of uniform distribution, yeah, and of bat size 64. So meaning that you're having 64 latent vectors of size 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100 right? And then we pass this, um, so look at it as a batch of images or a batch of latent vectors. You pass this batch into your generator. The generator generates fake images out of it, yeah? Now, after generating fake images out of it, you take the generated fake, the fake generated images, pass it through your discriminator, and you get your defake. Yeah, so you get um, you get your logic out of the discriminator. So now the reason why you're passing it to your discriminator, like I said above, is that you want to know how far it is from um, you want to know how far it is from what a real image should be, right? So that is why instead of passing it through a fake the fake loss function we have defined before, we pass it through a real loss function. So you want it to get closer. You are, you want to train your generator to get closer to being what a real image will be like. So you are using the real loss. So you are trying to um, you are trying to maximize the loss. Yeah. I think someone is. Um, so you are trying to maximize the loss. That's why we are using the inverse. So instead of pass, passing it through um, a fake loss uh, function to know how far it is from what if um, how far the the output is from what. Um, from being fake, or how far it is the how far the classifier is from how far the classifier is from a fake image. You want to know how far it is from a real image, yeah. So that's why we did this. And the loss you have you get out of this is what you use to do backup backup propagation on your generator, right? So now you keep doing this iteratively for the number of epochs that you have, right? And as you notice, what as you would notice, or as you would have already imagined. Your generator gets tries to get better at differentiating between real images and fake images. Meanwhile, your generator, that's your discriminator rather, your discriminator gets and um, tries to get better at this, um, differentiating between real images and fake images. Or well, on the other hand, your generator gets better at generating fake um, generating fake images that look like real images. So one way or the other, you find that your generator is is, is finding its way closer to the distribution of what a real image should be, right? Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. So um, here is just normal. Um, so now we are appending the loss. We want to know what the loss would look like, right? Um, and then we are starting. Why? Why did we start that since? since we have, uh, Okay, to generate samples. So now this is just to generate samples that would attend to the. Um, so remember, I told you that we we created this fix that. So we just want to generate samples after each um, epoch. So once this generated this fix generated samples, we want to um, after each epoch, we want to know how what the image looks like after each epoch. So we pass the the fix there, which is later in the code, through the generator that has been trained for that period. We get the samples there, and we append it to this this list of samples there. So um, after this um, um, code block, you will see what the samples look like um, as the training process was going on after each epoch. Yeah, and then we use people to save the training samples. Yeah, as these samples there. So this is the training process, and the loss as it goes up and down. So the loss is not, so you notice here that the loss is not really something you're trying to, as you're trying to minimize um, one, the other one is trying to maximize itself. So you find out that they are both trying to, they're they trying to strike a balance between themselves as the training goes on, yeah? So it's not where you are trying to reduce the loss of the, where your whole um, mindset is, this um, network must have zero loss. That's not the point now. You're trying to get to that point where the generator is good enough to generate realistic images, yeah? So um, this is what the loss, the plot of the loss looks like. So you find out that initially, the discriminator is um, the orange color, the, the, no, the discriminator is the blue color, the generator is the orange color. You notice that initially the loss of the generator was very high, yeah? But as the training went continued, you find out that 
the generator somehow was kind of um, the distribution of the loss, yeah, or the the the, rate, the values of the loss was kind of being in the same. Um, um, should I put in the same? What's the, what was this in English? So it was kind of playing out the same way the discriminator was, right? So at a point where it is played almost evenly as this discriminator, probably if I train it longer, it might kind of look similar. The distribution might kind of look similar. Yeah? At that point, you see your generator is kind of getting closer to what the distribution of the discriminator is. Yeah, the images are. Okay? <coughs> So now I'm picking out random samples from this, um, picking out random images from the sample we have, we've already um, seen. This is what you would have. So you'd see that this is what your discriminator, your generator generated, right? So looking at it after each um, epoch, you find out that your generator started out with trash, trash images. That's the truth. These are trash images, yeah? Started out with trash images. Then as it continued, it got better. Yeah. Still, the, the, you can't really make any sense out, out of these images that are here. As it continued, it got better, better. And see, at this point, you, at least you can notice what this was. You can actually um, place a number to these images you are seeing here. Yeah? <clears throat> so from the top of my head, this looks like a six. This looks like one. This looks like five. This looks like nine. This looks like two. This is one, one, nine, seven, seven, nine. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to say, yeah? And um, you can actually just save your generator model and use it to generate images later. So I saved the generator model here, but unfortunately it's on my system, not on this particular system I'm using now. So I just saved the model, generated the model again, and then you can just keep passing in latent vectors of the size that you have defined earlier. You can't just pass any size. Remember it was a 10 by 10, which is 100 latent vector that you pass in. You can just keep passing um, a latent vector into your generator model, just like I did here, yeah? Pass a latent vector, this is um, how we generate it. Pass it into this, yeah? And it's, the output is an image, yeah? And then we can just plot this image, right? So um, I didn't, like I said, I don't have the model here. I'll just um, load the model and then just keep um, refreshing or re yeah, refreshing this um, code cell. And then you see that it generates random images at each refresh. Yeah, just like you'd see in the, this, this person does not exist for site, right? So well, you would notice that this is not, you won't say this is um, so good for its performance. Yeah, it's, it's partly dependent on the kind of data sets we're using. Yeah, but still, it can be better. Um, some questions you might have in your mind is that, um, is it possible for us to use um, convolutional neural networks um, if you're, when, when dealing with images? Of course, you can use convolutional neural networks. And I think that's what everyone should try out, yeah? I might not have so much power to give you guys assignments for, I think I can, I should just say that um, you guys should actually go through this um, notebook. Based on what I've explained, I'm sure you should be able to understand every step in it. Then I want you, I would want you guys to try out, um, um, it's, it's very similar to what you have here to start with. Yeah. I would want you guys to try out using convolutional neural networks instead of, um, instead of using your normal fully connected layers. Yeah. So what that would entail is that when you're building your model, you won't have um, you won't have linear, linear, linear here. You'd have your curve to be, yeah. Um, but for the discriminator, you'll be doing the transpose of your curve to be. So there's a function to do the transpose, you know, in PyTorch, and then just try that and see how 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 it um, how your output comes out to be. It will definitely be better, yeah. So are there any questions before I, I call back your instructor? Any questions? Come in, taking time. Thanks.
please, if you have questions, don't think, don't, just, just ask questions. I think we still have to go through it well now. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try, try it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. But how is the class going? I hope you guys are learning a lot because um, I've been going, through, I've been seeing the topics and I know it's, it's yeah, it might look a bit um, abstract initially, but if you look at it in this, it's actually very interesting. The, con the intuition behind it is very, very interesting. And once you know, know the intuition, the only thing left is just how to play around with the codes, yeah? And just build more mm -hmm. intuition, right? It's, it's a hard part, I know. But later on, you'll find out that anything that comes after this will be quite easy, yeah? We hope so. <laughs> oh, it's be easy. It's be easy. Trust me. Trust me. I pray so. <laughs> and don't don't be discouraged, please. Don't be discouraged. I, there's something I always say for those who I have taught before. It's it's all right to if if you if you go through something today, something as abstract as deep learning or even machine learning. And then you you kind of understand it today, and then you notice that tomorrow you've forgotten everything you, you learned yesterday. Then it means that you're a normal person because it, it also happens to me. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that you should give hope, lose hope. Yeah, it happens to everyone. All it just means is that means is that you should um, just revise it. If you revise it, you find out that you understand it better than even what you thought you understood yesterday. And then don't be. Um, don't be shy or reluctant to um, teach people when you have the opportunity. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be stepping out now. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So um, see, it was it was a very long course. But the first thing I was very sorry to know is that I don't know why we are shy, but I know that many of us have issues, especially with this particular one girl. Because even me, to be sincere, like it took me a while, and even up to now, I'm still learning that gun thing. But at least I have some form of intuition. Okay. Sorry, I just wanted to chip in something. So, so you know that um, the learning curve continues here. Yeah? There's something I'm actually trying out on gun that is. Actually, my head. You see that style gun, okay? So, so as you go on, you see more complex things. So just don't be discouraged. As we are here, also we are also suffering the same thing. I'm trying to crack my head around gun. So I was like, is it not the same gun? Yeah, this one is simple, but as you go higher, it might get a bit more complex. But if you can build yourself now to struggle with um, confusion, struggle with um, um, things that seem difficult. Once you're able to get out of that phase, trust me, everybody will be looking at you as a king. So just try now and keep trying as you learn. Yeah? Okay. okay. Yeah, so I wanted to just like say something. I'm so sorry because the time has gone already. It's almost four o'clock. So um, just confirm, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, okay, so like I know that we we'll have issues actually with this part, but there's there are just two things that I want us to like take very, very seriously, the whole machine learning thing. The first one is machine learning as a whole, both deep learning and machine. And the second one is convolutional neural networks. So like understanding each of those layers helps because now you've seen that, first of all, for that style transfer, that we're manipulating those layers. So I think if you go back and then go through that one, you can easily get what's happening with the convolutional layers and the rest. But the second one is one that is very, very applicable to all parts of machine learning as far as it's supervised, which is the difference between the target variable and the um, predicted one. So, sorry, let me just do this thing. So, I don't know if you understand this, this thing here. I mentioned it where well, we're still able to see when you have something like this. So, this is very, very, very important in the whole machine learning world. I don't know, have we seen something like this before? Yes. Exactly. So, like, to be sincere, if you can understand this thing, you almost be setting of everything in supervised learning. 
So the point now is that now while you are training for everything you do, you always have to compute the difference between your target and your actual value. So I can just call actual A. The target is C and your actual. So you just have to find the difference between two of them. So this difference can be different ways. It can be squared difference. It could be mean squared difference. It could be that cross entropy because cross entropy is another one. So there are different ways to which you can define this. And the main thing is that that will give you your G. So the point now is that why this is very important is because when you complete this difference, eh, it tells you how far your mood, your, your um, target is from being the actual thing you want to predict. So for instance, you start the random thing now, that's the point of this bell-shaped thing. If you are currently at somewhere here, I'll just put this as X now. So we all point of that derivative things, which is that gradient descent, finding gradient, and all is that these are your features or your parameters. Um, this, this would be your parameters. I'm just using one, but in most cases, you have multiple parameters, especially when it comes to image. So you have different parameters. So the point is that these parameters are what make up your final output. So the point is that you want to reduce this thing that's bring it towards the end here. You want to minimize it. So there's one thing that you always have to note is that when you minimize this thing here, you expect this loss to reduce. And by minimizing this thing, it means you are changing values of this to affect this loss. So you keep iterating and changing this value. So as you're iterating, you are changing this value to reduce the loss. But you know that now this loss is defined by these two parameters. You always have to know that your loss is defined by these two parameters. So it depends on what your target is and what your actual and what your actual thing is. So now, now if you now bring it to our what we spoke about in um uh what is this, the style, in that start um, style transfer. So in style transfer, if you notice we're not actually updating it like this, we're updating the image itself where the difference was the um content features, um let me just call it the target features, which is the and the content features. So this is the loss. So what did you want to update? You wanted to update the image values, the image pixels or the image values in order for these two things to be together. So that's still another form of this gradient descent. For this time, we're not using derivatives. We're not using, we are still using derivatives, sorry. But it's more like we're updating parameters. The whole point is that whenever you want to update something or reduce loss, you always have to use this procedure. That's something that's very important. So we apply it in that style transfer. We saw it happening in that place where we computed the difference and did it. So now for this, um, uh, what is this again? GANs, because honestly, GANs is one very, very confusing thing. But if you just understand the basic concept, which I'll try and do as fast as possible now, you really have issues understanding with it again. So you know, we already mentioned that we have the discriminator. I'll just call this D. So I'll just use the visual way to explain how it works. I will have a, okay, I think I will use um, something like this. So I will know how it's working. So we have an image here. So we are doing something like this. This is our discriminator here. So our discriminator takes in an image. It takes in an image. Ah, I don't like what I'm here. I'll just use IM. It takes in an image here. And then what it does is that it outputs two things. So now, you know, if you look at it now, in this style transfer and this one, we didn't just do it the normal way we were doing it. This one, we computed losses for the two different classes. You know, normally in Python, when we started, we we're computing the losses together because we already had a data set and we had each of the labels. So you can do it that way. So whenever you find the total loss, using that way, where you have both the labels and the, um, but when you have both labels on the same data set, you can do it that way. That one already sums everything up. But in this case, whenever you're computing loss, whenever you're training, you pass in your zeros class inside this discriminator and tell that this is zero. You train it, you pass in your one class and tell that this is one and you train it. So the point is that whenever you train this discriminator, you expect it to take in an input image. So at this point, it takes in an input image here. So this input image, when it takes it, it's then classified as either an original image, which is a real image or a fake image. So the point is that when you start, you have your, um, you have your, your generator here. 
So your generator's job now is to generate images. So your generator, like you said, it starts with just a different vector. So in most cases, it's 10 by 10, so which is 100 in dimension. So now this thing, when you start, you expect it to generate total nonsense. So when you generate this total nonsense now, eh, you pass it into our discriminator. So when this nonsense passes to our discriminator, this is what we use to train the discriminator to, because we need to train the discriminator. When you pass it for the first time during the training of the discriminator, the discriminator takes an original image. And so let me just put it like this. It takes an original images. So I'll just call this arrow n. So these are real, or rather arrow i, real images. Takes in real images, and then the difference to when when you get your output logic, you might not, you know, the normal way. Like I've just said, isn't that thing? Everything in this thing dependent on your your this thing, your target, and what you got. So when you get an output for these real images, you might not see from one. But if you notice, they used what they call smooth. So in this case, it's no more one. It's zero point nine. But let's just see why it's in one. So it is one minus that. So if our stuff predicted three images at 0 0.2, you can see that the loss is much because we are aiming for one and it gave us 0 0.2. So the loss is 0 0.8. So it then start optimizing, which will do back propagation and optimize it, your, your distance, your discriminator in the way that what is now seen, in the way that the way to operate, we then make sure that whenever it is three images, it will be coming upward to one. So that's the frame between it and that one. So that's it. So now when you give it fake images now and you pass fake images. So let's just say your, your discriminator predicted 0 0.5. It will compute the difference between it and this one. So you know that difference is 0 0.5. So you start optimizing in order to make sure that it's getting something close to zero whenever it sees fake images. So now you first of all pass your model. You first of all done your discriminator training. So your discriminator takes in these fake generated images takes in the images and then knows whether it is one or zero. So you've changed your discriminator. So now you then use this your generator to pass it through that same discriminator you just trained now. So your discriminator will most likely penalize this guy and say that see like your script, you are not you are not an original image. So now let's just say it tells it that see I know you very well. You are not an original image. I'll give you 0 0.1 which is very very in fact let's just say 0 0.01 means that you have almost certain that you're a fake image. So now when you tell it that it's almost taking this fake image now, now if I compare this with zero, it means I want to do my discriminator training. But because it's a generator and I want this generator to be able to predict original images, which the class original images is one. So it means that my loss will now be this minus one. But in this case it's absolute. So, you know, we have definitely have to use absolute. So it's more like one minus 0 0.01, which is about 0 0.99, that kind of thing. So now when it knows that, see, this is very, very far from being an original image. When you then do back propagation, we respect this generator. Since the loss is very high as 0 0.09, it should start optimizing your generator towards making it close to one. When I mean making it close to one, it should start trying its best to achieve one. And that's how these guarantees work. It makes sure that as it's trying to make this, as it's trying to optimize this thing to, towards getting one, eh, unknowingly, this generator itself is changing things, changing parameters that will make it actually get an image itself based on this loss. So this time around, that's what it means by maximizing. So now you are trying to step this guy up towards being an actual image. That's why we're using the loss as this. If I use the loss as zero, it means I'm just making it worse than what it already is. So we are just trying to upgrade this one. So now in terms of probability, you can actually stick with the probability. So this discriminator has a probability for it, which it uses to know fake images and original images. So now the point is that this generator is trying to achieve that same probability that this discriminator is into to identify fake images. That's the whole point of it, trying to fool the discriminator. So once it achieves that distribution at which the discriminator is used to know fake images, then it has almost started generating real images. So at that point now, uh, that's where they call equilibrium, where the generator is very, very good at generating good images, that when you then pass it as a fake image, the way you're trying to the discriminator, the discriminator doesn't even know which one is real and fake again. So that's the whole point of the equilibrium aspect of it. <laughs> Did that make sense or did I try?
Can we let him work yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here. Yeah, we are here. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's making he's making more sense now. He's making I yeah. making more sense. Yeah, so like what I was also know is that the whole point is that we're working with this loss. Is this loss that makes us know? You know that now this loss for this case now, forget I'm doing this, I'm supposed to get a negative value. But in the normal case, the loss is like 0 0.99, I think. 0 0.99 plus 0 0.01 will give you one. So this is like the loss. So you can see that the the, the generator loss is very high. So this is the loss on it being an actual one. For this discriminator, if if he if he tells you that this generator was, let's just say, if he passed the generator, he got 0 0.2. So it would be 0 0.2 minus 0. That's what we all know. So you know that this, this is how you move. It means that our loss is 0 0.2. So we'll be back propagating with this particular loss to update it. If he predicted this as 0 0.6, it means that the loss is 0 0.4. So we'll be back propagating with your original image to make sure that it's able to get something like this. But for this one, that's not the whole point of the whole dance, the point that you want to generate your images. So if you're making use of this loss, so as you keep training the generator, this loss would be reducing. In the normal case, it's maximizing actually, because you are trying to fool this guy. It's maximizing, but maximum, using, maximum, um, using maximum method is very, very computationally expensive. So you prefer to just sw um, swap the labels when you swap the labels, you then start reducing the error, the difference between this one and one. So if this one is able to get to one at all, eh, then it means that it's very, very good at generating good images. So whenever it generates an image, this guy, this illustrator will say this is an image, and it also be no minus one, which is error. So you cannot take this guy as, as our judge that will tell you how far this is from telling the truth or doing the right thing. So, and what makes it make sense is the fact that for each training procedure, this discriminator keeps getting better. This generator keeps getting better. Because whenever this one gets better, you pass it here and say that these are fake images. So this one will know that it is fake and this one is real. But that point where the images it start generating are almost, or if it's the same thing with this one, then wow, it means you have gotten a good generator. So that's just how it is. So, like there's, in, I was just want to show something for it. It's not going to take time at all. So when I worked with this thing, there was one I worked on. So that's, I, I did this anime generation. So this was it here. So I don't know if I still have the output of it. So this was it. So that's where he then spoke about using um, colored images. That's, I mean, convolutional neural network instead of just using um, your linear layer. So in this case now, there's what they call the convolution. The convolution is for doing backwards things. So look at this here. These are normal classifier, which is for the discriminator, where you use a convolutional neural network. Therefore, our generator, Python already provided the function, which is conv transpose. So this one does reverse convolution. So instead of it to be reducing the convolutional, in terms of convolutional layers, it keeps increasing. That's the generator. So after I finish training, um, I hope I have the output here. Yeah, so this was what the distance generated. This was what the GAN generated from it. So you can just try it out. You can read about the reverse using convolutional and guns for colored images. You can just check about it. So thanks. So like I've said, okay, this is the old one I did. Like I've said, just try and know that whenever you want to make something better, you have to first find the loss. After finding the loss, use gradient descent to make that loss reduce. So in, for the generator side, we're making the loss reduce with respect to it being an original image. So that's the good thing about your network. You can almost do such. So that was it, thanks. Sorry for taking everyone's time. It has been a very long one. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Anyways, have a nice day. Yes. Yeah, yeah I'll spend much more tonight. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Stan. You're welcome. So um, I guess you expect more questions from us when we go through the notebooks. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. All right. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bye.